Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, January 21, 2016 regular meeting of the Hopkinton School Committee. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. We're going to start with recognition, moving into public comments, and then we'll start with followed by new business, where we'll do 2017 intent to travel recommendations, high school Spartan club stipend, the need for 2.4 FTE paraprofessionals, awarding of high school diplomas, superintendent's budget recommendation, school committee policy, school owned vehicle policy. Capital Project School Department article warrants, and the superintendent's contract. We don't have any old business, and then we will have a second opportunity for public comment and items by consensus. So Dr. McLeod, do you want to start with recognitions? Sure, thank you. Um, first, I'd like <coughs> to recognize um, Mr. Bob Burlow, who um, had his last day with us in district yesterday. Um, he's pursuing an opportunity in Wachusett as the Deputy uh, Assistant Superintendent there. Um, I wanted to just recognize all of the wonderful things that Bob provided, first as a uh, secondary curriculum director um, and then taking on the role of Assistant Superintendent. He was here for six years uh, and has really taken us to a, d a new level in terms of where we are with curriculum alignment, vertical alignment. Um, worked very, very closely with the teachers in, in announcing that he was leaving. There certainly has been um, a lot of, of teachers reaching out, just telling him how, how, how much he's going to be missed and how much they appreciate all that he's done for the district, both from a curriculum perspective, but also recognizing, you know, the, the, the things, and we talk about this, the professional development and the materials that teachers need to do their job well was really in his realm and he always worked very hard to be very equitable in terms of distribution of materials but also to make sure that the teachers had the professional development they needed to be successful um, so I wanted to recognize it was unfortunate that I couldn't do it with him sitting here by my side but the timing of his announcement just didn't allow that to happen so um, Bob if I'm sure you're at home watching tonight and we miss you already um, your chair is very vacant down there um, just thank you very much, and um, I didn't know if, if anybody else wanted to add to that. I'm looking I, at you, Jean. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, Bob was really a tremendous um, contributor, I, I guess I would say, to the district. He just, and, and was such a, just had such a calming presence on all the chaos that comes at us from so many different directions, and I know that's something that people really valued about him in addition to the quality work that he did, um, but just the type of person that he was and the way he carried himself was so reassuring. He was just a very thoughtful, quiet leader, and um, I know he'll be sorely missed. He showed me a poem that the CTLs wrote for him, and I could never repeat it, but it made me it made me cry, and it wasn't even about me. It was just really so heartfelt, and I thought, well, this, this should be the job description that we post. Um, when we look for your replacement, so he will not, be, it'll be impossible to fill his shoes, but really thank you so much for everything that he did and best of luck. Um, it's a great opportunity for him and a much more sane commute, yes. for sure. Thank you. Um, I'd also, I have uh, uh, Tara Sanda and Aaron Graziano. Could you come up so I can, can uh, recognize you publicly here and people can see your faces? <coughs> Aaron and Tara and I meet monthly to talk about um, HPTA. They are the leadership representing the HPTA. I don't know how many members uh, members you have <coughs> on your board, but it's extensive, like how, hundreds. Um, so I just want to begin by recognizing all of the work that you do every day in our schools, the enrichment that you provide for special occasions um, at assemblies, but also the after-school opportunities for kids. I don't think people realize how much, I mean, teachers do, but I don't know that everybody realizes how much you do quietly in the background. And that's why I wanted you to be here tonight because so much of what you do for kids is in the background. And I, I want to publicly recognize you. It's so appreciated. It 
provides another layer for children, for your children, for the community's children that they otherwise just wouldn't have. Um, and it also supplements the budget um, through all of your fundraising. And so specifically tonight, um, I wanted to recognize that you've awarded some grants at the different schools. I happened to have been at the Elmwood School today where one of the grant recipients was notified that she was going to receive the grant and the principal said to her, I wish that you could be at the meeting to see what a difference this has made to this individual. She was so pleased. And so this is the Elmwood grant, iPads for Specialists. Um, she's so excited about the kinds of things that she's going to be able to do to enrich her program. Uh, but what was mentioned was that this also happens to be the individual who had to give up her classroom to accommodate preschool. And that was, that was difficult, that she had the health classroom. And so to be able to give back in a small way, to show how re we recognize everything that she does for the school. Um, so there are three iPads. And so sorry, three, I saw $3,000. So six iPads um, for specifically for the specialists. They're providing RTI. They're, they're providing additional um, activities for kids. And they're very excited about some of the things that they're going to be able to do once they have iPads. So um, that was the, awarded at the Elmwood School. The Center School was awarded flower pots. And Erin, if you could describe, because I think you do it so well, the, the climbing on the stairs issue. Right. So I just think these, all of these um, requests are so creative. At, oh, and also, sorry, I didn't mean to miss this, but also at the Elmwood School, um, awarded $25 so that they could purchase a plaque for the buddy bench. Oh. And is that, is that to recognize so the, the contributor? Purchased actually through the box top program at yeah. the school. So. Wow. So using their money from all those box tops that everybody collects. They purchased the buddy bench. That's awesome. Um, at the Hopkins School, a leveled literacy program kit valued at six thousand uh, dollars. They are so. The reason that that one I wanted to mention to the school committee that the reason that was not part of our budget was because the, the assistant principal went to a professional development in the summer um, and was so excited about what this could op could provide to the school in terms of leveled intervention for kids. And I know. Two of you were at the CPAC meeting this week where we talked about ELA and what are we doing for kids. And this is filling that gap at the Hopkins School. Um, but we hadn't budgeted for it because this came after, obviously, the budget process. So um, thank you for, for funding that. It, it's um, going to allow us to also evaluate and budget for more of these kits across the district. Um, and, and as you know, the school administration is just thrilled that they're going to be able, they could never have afforded it otherwise. Um, there were no requests submitted at the middle school. Not this year. Not this year. That's because they got their innovative classroom at the end of last year from the trustees. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the high school, smaller requests, the trip to the Met, they did have some monies from something that wasn't fulfilled the previous yeah, year. Yeah, unfortunately the drama club couldn't go abroad and we had given money for that, so they're going to use that to fund this art trip to the Metropolitan. And top of the hill plaques. The the hill. Yeah. So I don't know if there's, if you would like, thank you on behalf of all of the schools <coughs> for all of these. I don't know if you would like to add to my comments about all of the things that HPTA I think does. you covered it beautifully. I guess my only thing that I would say is um, come out to Chili Cook-Off on a couple of weekends because the money that we make at these fundraisers, as you said, does go towards continuing to be able to fund programming like that at the schools. And we want to, as we say, keep it going and keep it growing. Well, and I'll just add, because, uh, you know, in response to the conversation we had last week, that your roles are so important in giving feedback to administration, to focusing things that matter to kids that continue. We talked about um, 
the Kenyan Runner Day, and traditions that are so important to the district, you keep those things in, you know, in, in the forefront, even though there's changes in administration. So it's such an important role, and I think that sometimes people maybe don't understand how much of input that, that you do have. Um, so thank you for all that you do. Thank you for being here and giving us a chance. I see that there are some of your children here since the whole family <laughs> is at the table. Yeah, <laughs> um, well, yeah I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you both you. very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so now we have an opportunity for public comment. Okay, moving on to reports to the school committee. Um, I don't see anyone here from student council. And so we'll move to the cross country course with Mr. Kilda. So we have, can I, may I just say, we have one of our very best friends here tonight and one <laughs> of our greatest supporters. And Mr. Kilda, if, if I may just, um, I'll just read the objective um, to what you're proposing and then I'll turn it over to you. So Mr. Kilduff is here tonight um, with the objective of securing the support and approval of the Hopkinton School Committee to proceed with building a cross-country course on town of Hopkinton property, which is under the jurisdiction of you, under your jurisdiction. Um, he provided a very compelling opportunity for us to consider, and I've invited him here tonight, uh, along with his colleagues, to um, to pitch it to us. Okay. okay. to cross-country courses. Um, both of them have extensive experience and uh, recently completed in the National Club Championships in California. So they not only started early in high school, but <laughs> continue to run fast. Um, also, I want to uh, recognize Laura McKenzie. Uh, I'm sure some of you know Laura. Laura is uh, a coach at the, at the middle school level, uh, does a terrific job. Uh, a very capable runner herself. Uh, the reason we want to be the reason we're here is, uh, and the reason we want to present this idea is, is, uh, is because in large part there are 90 <laughs> students in the uh, middle school uh, level that participate in cross country. Uh, that's a group that Laura coaches, and there are 90 plus uh, students at the high school level. Uh, considering the size of, of hopping in, that's really phenomenal. The other is you have um, under your jurisdiction some prime property uh, behind the, the high school and the middle school. And uh, Peter uh, has been involved in the development of the center trail. Uh, and we think uh, this idea will uh, be of use not only to students but the community in general. So I'm going to turn it over to the content experts, as I refer to them, to take you through the presentation. <coughs> you might just want to pull the mic. Thanks for having us. Um, I lived in town for 12 years. I ran uh, four years uh, cross country in a nationally ranked high school program. So I had this great experience and then I ran uh, for Boston College. And uh, I've continued running now. I run the marathon every year. And um, you know, running is very much part of one of the reasons we moved to Hopkins. Um, Cross-country running is, uh, I just wanted to touch a little bit on cross-country itself. It's different from track or, you know, running in general because it's a team sport. And it's a sport that favors um, it can any athlete who wants to work hard. You know, the track sometimes favors the gazelle, you know, the marathoners, you know, favors the Kenyans. <laughs> but cross-country <laughs> is, is truly a great sport because you can get athletes from all different walks of life, especially at a young age, and make them part of a team. And the, the kids who work the hardest end up doing the best, and it's a great lifelong lesson. And, you know, Tim mentioned that Peter and I just got back from the uh, Masters National Championships, and one of the great things about being out there was that it was still all the same guys who are all old now, and uh, but all the guys I ran against in high school and college. So the experience they had starting at an early 
time in their life they you know they brought on with them and you know our race had 1200 runners in it so um you know that that's what cross country is it's it's different than running and one of the things i think was very important about my experience it was that um there was a culture that came up from uh from the team that was fostered around the school and a big part of that was having the course on the school property um so you know why you know why have a course i mean we have a course now but it's not on you know they they, they get bus to it it's not on school property why why be bothered building a course on the property and a big part of that for me would be the benefit to the school itself um you know hopkinton is a running community we are the starting line of the most famous marathon in the world um we've got a great uh running club which if I don't know if any of you are involved with the running club, but you know they do a couch to 5K program and it sells out, and you know it's got this great community aspect to it. We have these great network of trails that we're developing. Um, yet all of these things you know, kind of put together. To me, the best part of running in my career was cross country, and we don't have a home cross country course. Um, so one of the things in a you know, for a cross country course to build a culture around it is having the support of the other teams. So, you know, a football game or a soccer game, you get all of the school, all the student population comes out to go to those games because there's a social aspect to it. Cross country runners don't necessarily get that, but the high school that I ran for, it was incredible because our entire school came out because we ran around their practices. So, that, you know, so we would, they would literally, our course worked its way, weaved its way in and out of the fields that um, they were practicing on, and the entire school are, would come out and watch, and the, the uh, other teams would literally stop what they were doing and cheer us on for the 30 seconds it took for us to run through. And that is what contributed to us becoming a nationally ranked program. It wasn't. It wasn't necessarily the kids or the coach or, you know, all. It was all these things. But it was the fact that became running a cross country, being a cross country runner on that team and being able to run in front of a home field, drew more kids to the program. Um, you know, having. I'll get into in one second, what what the aspects of a good cross country course are, but. The other nice thing about having a course is that, so our, my high school cross country team, we travel to all the national meets. Um, there's big national invitationals and that, that required funding. And we would host meets on our home course. You know, it was a resource for us. And the, the Boston running community has this great cross country series that already exists. And they're always looking for, you know, courses to have their meets on. It would be another opportunity you know, for the high school to raise money to travel to some of these meets, um, you know, so it, it's just one more way that it kind of be, the course would be part of the community and the uh, high school and middle school cross country teams. So, what is a good cross country course? You know, having run all over the country, I can tell you pretty emphatically, it is not a road race or a track track race. I mean, th those those have their um, they have their place, but cross country is running over a mixture of grass, dirt, trails, wood chips, sand. It's different surfaces, and it's um, it's it's a mix of strategy and uh, pace changes. So there's no just locking into a pace and you know being the fastest runner runner out there. That that guy or girl doesn't always win. The one who wins is a smart, strong runner who's positioned themselves well, and a good course allows that to happen. Um, there doesn't have to be a deciding hill, not one big giant hill, you know, to break up the course. What, what, it, what a good course really has is just un undulating hills, twisty turns, different surfaces that forces a runner to make a decision. So do you run harder earlier to run a straight line through this turn? Or do you hold something back and now you're running extra distance as you weave your way through these turns? These are all components of what would go into making a good cross country course. And if you walk around, um, like Peter and I have, around the 
uh, property here, we've got everything. We have all of the elements necessary to really design a not not a state cross country course, a world class cross country course. Um, you know, the, the last thing I would add, just about a you know a cross country course, is that we do host the Boston Marathon every year. So you, you you're bringing in all these elite athletes. My sister in law. Running is in our family. My sister-in-law uh, was a two-time Olympian and ran in six world championships, including a bunch of cross-country world championships. And when she traveled to away, you know, marathons, track meets, whatever, she spent a lot of time searching out a soft surface to train on. So they, you know, they, they want, and it, you know, Marie, my sister-in-law, you know, she's not going to go running down, you know, a dirt trail. I mean, she wants a groomed surface that she could train on and that's because that's what the elites are used to so th there's that aspect to it too i mean you're you've got all these elites who are here throughout the year training for boston and then here for the week for the boston marathon we'd have a you know a, a course that they'd be able to take advantage of the local running community will be able to take advantage of and i i think for me most importantly the um you know the middle school and high school kids are going to have a team or a home course where they will, their team will develop. And I, I think that's really, you know, the difference in uh, making a great program. So, you want to take over? Sure. So what Ryan and I did was, um, because he's technically savvy and I'm not, <laughs> took his GPS and we basically walked sort of a, a preliminary vision of what the course could be. So it starts at the little green dot there, which is below the track, um, heads north from there, loops down to the far west corner. That's those, that lower soccer field furthest down the loop road. Then this uh, furthest to the left piece is out to the center trail. Then it loops back up through the woods, and that's the part we're going to have to work on. What we're looking to do there is put in a course that'll be in essence the same as what's on the center trail right now. There's an old cart path there that we hope to make use of. Um, some of that I think is actually on private property, but I have talked to the owner and I think we can make that work. That's, but if not, we can always come back to the school property and make it work. There's wetlands down in there, so we have to sort of dance around the wetlands. But again, I think it's, it's all doable. Um, I've been out there with the CONCOM agent already, and, and he agrees. He, he was very happy seeing that old cart path there. Comes back to the fields right by where the cell tower is, the uh, eighth grade softball field, um, and then up along the side there, and then across the uh, top, there's a big gate up there by the baseball field and goes across there. Ryan and I both have kids who will likely be running cross country, my sixth graders over there. And um, we were laughing, thinking about, particularly in high school, the third time coming up that hill is just going to be absolutely horrible <laughs> for them. <laughs> Pure suffering. But as someone who runs on that as a home course, that's a point where the coaches, the other team's coaches are going to be up in the top, and they won't be able to yell at their kids. The third time some other team comes up that hill, they're going to be just willing to stop if someone goes by it so we can coach our folks to go by them quickly there and take the fight out of them. That's what cross country has. It gives you that home course advantage, which is something that I think for a kid is really important to learn that there's different strategies in how, how to win. And that applies to life, obviously, as well as simply to racing. So that's basically that course. They come across, they go down. Um, around the field. What's shown here with these two loops is roughly 1.8 miles, roughly 3K, 3 kilometers, and that's essentially the middle school course which shown here. The next slide, what we have labeled is loop two, and I've got the picture up here on a poster board as well. This is the additional piece starting from that green going inside the loop road, and that's a really beautiful area in there. It's a, it's a pine grove in there. I don't know if any of you have been in there, but it's quiet and really nice in there. And it's not really used by the community right now. Um, so this is a great opportunity, again, from a cross-country perspective. There's something 
um, sadistic is the wrong word, but running through this beautiful peace and quiet while you're suffering at your, at your worst, because that's what you'll be doing in a cross-country course. But for the local residents, this is a beautiful chance to get in to the peace and quiet of a pine forest and just walk through with your dog or just by yourself. And, and it links up. There's the old rail bed is in there. This trail comes down again, some cart path, loops around the field, and then comes back along the old rail bed on the other side from the center trail. We're having one crossing. We want to cross at the same spot that has good visibility both ways. There won't for any race, we can station one person there and control traffic and not have anyone at risk pretty easily at that point. So that was obviously an important consideration. Um, you know, we are from a, again, getting off the cross country course and going back to discussing community trails. Where the um, center trail is, that, that doubled line piece coming in there, we're actually opening the uh, guardrail there and with the DPW's approval and um, and refunding that. So that will allow somebody to walk across then and connect up to this center part of the loop trail. So again, getting a little more access for the community to that center of the loop road, which as I said, is really kind of a hidden gem right now. So This shows just that wetlands issue on that, on that piece, just running east from the center trail. Um, just to give you sort of an idea of what we're dealing with in there. Um, so next. So in terms of a general implementation plan, and um, I've got the time frames up here. We're doing the initial work right now. Uh, engineering plans would hope to get Beals and Thomas out there um, in the spring, work through getting Conservation Commission approval. Um, I have an informal schedule with Conservation Commission on Monday. As I said, I've already wa walked this with the agent. There's definitely some wetlands issues in here um, that we'll have to deal with, but he seemed confident that, that we should be able to work through those. Um, you folks have some issues with the Conservation Commission in terms of certificates of compliance that need to be closed out and some work that needs to be done before that happens. Um, we're hoping that They'll decouple those for our project, but just um, I've been informed that will come up at the informal and more. So we're going to hear about it. You're probably going to get letters to that effect, but uh, it's I think we can probably decouple it if you thought that was likely. Um, construction, hope to start summer and fall. Plan would be. Um, similar to the work that was done on phase two of the center trail is to try to get the base done this fall let it sit for a little bit and then put the final on um, really in the spring um, perhaps have community races and starting in the in the summer of the next year and um, first race summer of uh, 2017 so that's sort of the timing we obviously try if we can if we can move it faster than that we will but I think that's probably a, a reasonable schedule um, you know I think as, as Tim mentioned cost uh, we've got a, a funding source for this so we're good on that end of things and, um, folks we've dealt with and Beals and Thomas and and I would plan to do this in the, the using the same approach that we use for the city both phases of the center trail, and in other words, try to do it using local guys. As long as we don't go above $10,000, we can sole source. Um, I've had great luck on those projects with getting uh, small local contractors to do the work um, and do, to do a great job. So we probably use that same strategy. It involves a little more sort of management, but I think the product is, is better as a result. Funding issue, uh, privately funded. We're, we're, uh, we're not suggesting that we use public funds. That needs to be done. And there's, uh, we've, we've started, a, there was an agreement between the, the foundation, the 26.2 foundation, foundation, the BAA, and the, and the school department, which, um, which Ellen and I have been authorized to begin to renegotiate. Uh, and that's where we expect the funds to come from. That's it. Thank you. Do you guys have questions?
Um, so I understand the construction funding. Um, what about maintenance? So does this become a school asset that well, that would be maintained through the district or? No, but what, so. it, well, it's your, it's on right. your property. We want to make that, that, but by the way, that we want to start off with everybody understanding that this is not, with all due respect, the Parks and Rec or any other committee in town, this is on your property. Uh, you know, scheduling uh, other meets, that sort of thing, and we go through the norm normal channels here. Uh, the funding source is big enough that we'll build in um, a, a fund to do that. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe not forever, but, um, and also uh, Ryan's talked about hosting other events here. When, 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 when schools do that, uh, there's, there's cash that gets brought into the yeah, into facilities, the right? Through yeah. sales of merchandise and and hot chocolate and whatever. Um, so we no. this is this would take some organization. Yeah, I'm not suggesting it, that would be a prohibitive item for me. I just want to make sure we understand from no, the operating we, we perspective. Don't that add, yeah, we we are yep. not interested yep. in adding anything, any kind of financial yeah. burden onto the onto the work that you all do. That's our goal. And, and I think the only other question I have is just sort of more a. It, logistical question. So Ryan, you mentioned the, the piece about people coming from who are running the marathon or training for the marathon coming out and having that surface, ha having trained in this town for that marathon and the time of year that you have to do it. Is, is it re are those surfaces, is it reasonable to keep it clear so that it is able to be um, trained on in the winter or is that? Oh, um, I mean, I, I would liken the surface to what, what the center trail is now. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean I, I don't know how easily that would be to yeah to yeah so it's I, that's what I was thinking <laughs> when you were the running club the would love me to you know yeah. shovel that and we're, <laughs> we're talking about a canopy for the center trail so but but yeah. no typically yeah. this would just so it would be beneficial if we have a winter like right. this but yeah. but certainly but it's, in it's a lot more of, the yeah. it's more the week it's before, before. Yeah. yeah now you've done it yeah, yeah. Was it? you just started uh, the winter none of us are saying it <laughs> it's like the week before a couple you yep. know the month before they come in. You know, so yeah. an elite runner who's going to train specifically on the course is going to, you know, that's their allotted time for, you know, asphalt running. Right. And then they're looking to run on other surfaces in between there. Yeah, I'm just always thinking for community runners yeah. who are tr looking for ways not to get hit yeah, by a car while they're training. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then i just wondering why we don't have to picture a picture of Tim up there running. Yeah. Too. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Where he is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know, I don't actually know who to give it to, so I'm going to give it to you, <laughs> is that in looking at the maps that were up there, I, I mean, it's not abundantly clear how close to some of the baseball and softball fields are. Like, has there been any discussion with our athletic director about how this might impact? <coughs> yes. <coughs> Tim has met, and I've been part of the conversations with the athletic director as well as the coaches, the track coaches, um, to get their support and assurances that it wouldn't interfere with other sporting events. Um, I really hadn't thought of, though, I love that, yeah. that the, the idea that this brings attention to a team that typically would be off doing their own thing. The fact that it is integrating with other, with other athletic events is really is very interesting. So yes, they, they um, have been part of the conversation from the very beginning and uh, they see it as a great opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Like, I, at my, the high school I grew up at, the cross country team, we threw all of our tennis courts and football fields, and we did get to cheer on our, you know, our fellow students at the time that we would be in our sports. But it's just hard to tell from the map. Like, mm. is that cutting through outfields? <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. Like, so that. If we go back to the map, it's mostly around. We work the course around. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, ideally the team stops practice for the. 30 seconds and cheers for their classmates as they go by, but you know, in most cases, if they didn't want to, they could continue with their practices. I, if I may, Laura, you? And, and from talking to the coaches, there are about four home meets a year, so we're not talking a, a lot of mm -hmm. scheduling impact here. So it's finding it's finding those four days and, and making it fit on those four days. 
and you know, and, and most of it is on the outside as well. I think this is fabulous. I'm sure they're going to make you take back the comment about bringing your dog. But Already, but I he saw you over there. <laughs> but um, other than that, it, I think it's it's awesome to be able to have another path through the, through the land. And I I'm, I had no idea that we could currently get back into that pine grove. So. Have you ever ever been in there? No. Spectacular. I've only been across at the field. Yeah, there's a, there's an entrance trail actually. Oh, there is. Just uh, before you get to Hopkins on the right. Oh, okay. Yeah. I do want to okay. let the school committee know that we did take care of any outstanding um, responsibilities okay. that we had with the conservation commission. So I don't know where that's coming from. We did that last year. There was money owed them from different projects, and there was another. Um, the terminology that you used in terms of um, yeah and we we went through all of that I met with them so it could have been somebody on the committee that wasn't aware of that but we you're in good shape we took care of all that good yeah and I met with Halt too that's the other Halt has a conservation restriction on the land and so I've talked to them and yeah so this isn't on as a business item so it's not requiring a vote but I wonder if what we wanted to do was provide a report, give you the information, um, get your feedback in terms of if there was additional information that you needed in order to bring it back as a business item that you could vote on. Um, it sounds like you've gone through all the steps with the, all the different committees. So I don't know if the school committee um, has additional pieces of information that you would need prior to being comfortable making a vote at a future meeting. If I have a question. Okay. Yeah. Facilities are required to uh, give us a certificate of insurance, uh, naming us as additional insured. So, if anything should happen, um, we're held harmless effectively. So no change in our policy required. Okay. So, do we have any safety or liability concerns with respect to just sort of unfettered access, like someone here for the marathon and, and wanting to look for a soft surface? Yeah. Right. And, and Massachusetts has some good laws protecting homeowners. As long as you're not charging people <coughs> to use the facilities, you're fine. Okay. Note, Ellen, what another interesting asset that you have is the Sloop Road. This time of year, I, uh, that Sloop Road is well lit. Mm -hmm. so a lot of people use it, at, even at this hour. So that's sort of my concern is that it's not well lit and that it's sort of I mean, you can assume that people always behave appropriately, but you can also maybe take a guess that some people will go in there and hang out at night and do things. Maybe that this doesn't happen. <laughs> All right. Really? They, could, they could be doing <laughs> some <laughs> church. Oh, other than just running down there. there. Yeah. I, mean, I don't want to go there. Uh, to, uh, here. Uh, have there been any uh, concerns expressed like that about Center Trail? Right. Um, Again, there have been question. concerns expressed, but no evidence of any sort of any of those sort of issues. And again, from a liability point of view, because we don't charge, uh, the Mass Recreational Use Law is is very strong and very protective. No need for signage. No. Okay. Nope. It doesn't sound like anybody has questions. I would be happy to make a motion tonight for whatever you know if we need to endorse this or request that you you know this will on your plate and we're going to later talk about all the other things you already have on your plate so you know to make it clear that if that's acceptable to you that you know we'd like to have you continue to work with them and both of both of these gentlemen have a long and well documented track record with great play i know with great quality um and the center trail project is gorgeous every time tim comes he brings us money or some benefit to the district so yeah, That's why we like it when he comes. <laughs> yeah, so I don't have any concern that this won't go equally well. And I think, you know, unless anybody has questions that we that need further information, I, I would say we're ready to move forward tonight so that they can get going and the kids can be running on it in the fall. I, I was thrilled. I, I just assumed it would take so much longer. So that's so great that they can use it for their next cross country season basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i think that would be great so so do you want to make a motion yes so okay. um i would i would make a motion to um endorse the what project 
cross country core project and um, request. Oh, I would use like the objective. To, yes, endorse the cross country project and ask that the superintendent work um, with Mr. Kilduff and Mr. Lagoy and I'm sorry, Davenport. Mr. Davenport to uh, proceed with the building of a cross country course on the town of Hopkinson property, which is under our jurisdiction. Second. All those in favor? Yes. 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 And then, okay. Thanks for your time. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thanks for what you're doing. Keep it up. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Peter, could you grab that for me, please? Do we have any liaison reports? I do. Go ahead. I have several. Oh, all right. So, step one. So we had a presentation, we had several presentations, one about the site placement updates that have happened in the last few weeks. There's been a lot of subcommittee meetings, I know there's been educational program meetings that have driven a lot of the content that we saw last night. They are getting really down into the details now, you know, one of the days of just a classroom will be a square. It's, they showed us where the furniture placement will be, where the rugs will be, where the easels, you know, what the teachers have requested through from everything from a really deep sink in this classroom to two shallower sinks in this classroom. And it was really great to start seeing the, the layout of the pre-K classes, the kindergarten classes, the first grade classes. We saw the health room, the art room, um, the administrative areas with the, with the principal's office and the desks and the, where the copier machine's gonna be. Um, so that was really cool. So we got to see the different layouts of those rooms. And I think up next, in the next round are like the library, um, maybe the cafeteria, we saw the music room. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the playgrounds. They've done a couple kind of shifts in the outline of the building and they have calculations based on number of kids expected to have certain square footages of um, playground, outdoor space. So they are far exceeding what they think they're going to need and especially exciting last night was uh, um, a rendering of a, an area outside that would be more natural surface. It would be less like mowed grass. It would be, maybe they said you could bring some stumps out there and people could go out and have kind of an outdoor platform instead of in a more structured environment that would be on this like more natural surface out there. So that was really great. Um, we talked about briefly the interlock with Park and Rec with the EMC Park and how that's progressing. There is a discussion about a bike, bike path attachment on there that's still ongoing, so that's going on. Um, there was a civil engineer there talking about drainage and uh, hooking up to the sewer system and where the culverts are going to be and a lot of drainage type of updates there. We looked at all the spaces and then we kind of ended the, the night looking at exterior materials. So John missed a very exciting vote on a recommendation for exterior look and feel of the building. Um, so it was just to bring back to the working group, but it was just to get a, an idea from the ESBC that was there at the table what they think about the different exterior uh, materials and design that they would use there. You can tell from listening to them that they've put so much thought into every single thing they're presenting. And they just kept hearkening back to the educational plan. Like nothing is decided without interlock of the educational plan. It's been incredible. Right? Every time, oh, one of the exciting discussions last night was the addition of, the, what did they call them? They called them, what was the word about they used? The toilet um, <coughs> blocks? Toilet, toilet, toilet blocks, blocks or they something? They changed the configuration. So of they've the added toilet, like a group, like a restroom instead of like all the pre-K classes and the kindergarten classes have their own restrooms in them. But they've added also, based on feedback they got from the educational program, a, a set set of restrooms in the middle of each wing so that they can be used by, in case there's more than one child, in one of those classrooms. So they've added two of those, which let them you know, bring out the building so the outdoor patios got larger. I mean, everything they do, they like shifted the field this way a little bit so that they can go back into the corner. I mean, everything is just so, it's getting so real. It's, it's just really cool to see. So next steps were the 
Construction manager at risk. I think the interviews are this Friday. Oh, right, that's tomorrow. That is tomorrow. So I think there's there's three, you said, Ralph, that are being interviewed tomorrow. And so they expect to have a recommendation. And the, the, the ESBC board last night um, voted or moved to endorse the sub subcommittee that's working on that hiring decision to move forward with it since you're the ones that are going to be the closest to that, that effort. Um, just to add, the, the names of the three CM at risk firms okay. are Colin Antonio, who's from Holliston, Consigli, who's from Milford, and W.T. Rich, and I'm not sure where they're from. And I didn't mention where they were from. Uh, there was a fourth um, um, proposer, but their uh, proposal arrived 20 minutes late, so we had to turn them away at the door uh, because of bid laws. But the the people that we're working with have worked with all of the three that we've gotten and had good opinions of all of them. So I think they were looking forward to the, to the interview process. I tomorrow. think it's going to be very exciting uh, okay. to see how it all works out by the end of tomorrow. Okay. We're going to know um, who pretty much who, who the firm is going to be. And I think the coolest sentiment that people gave yesterday was, we need to look for somebody who's going to fit in with the family that already exists. Oh. So it's like everyone's working so well together that there's a lot of um, concern that you pick the right you know, personality fit along with the right, you know, on paper fit to go with it. Pretty much the cost Project. is going to be the cost for the construction manager. If you looked at, you know, the three firms, they're pretty close. So, yeah, it really is going to come down to fit. Right. So, I think that's okay. about Kelly, it. Kelly, can I just make a little <laughs> plug and thank you for that overview. Yeah. It, it, really ha it really is a team and we have very collaborative meetings, but an example so Cal is one of the architects. An example of what he did at our meeting on Wednesday. You mentioned that. Yeah. The cubby? The yeah. cubicle. <laughs> so we were trying to visualize the student, the, the kindergarten and first grade cubicles in the hallway and what that was going to look like. And much discussion went into it the week before. He came with a life-size <clears throat> cubby rendition that he had made out of some kind of particle board. And with great detail about the height of the smallest he'd researched the youngest, the, the tiniest kindergartner would be this height. The largest first grader would be that height. The, this would be, the, <laughs> and he gave it to Lauren to take back to the building to measure up against the children to see what it would work like. We want to fit in the lunch boxes, put the, I mean, the level of detail is unbelievable. Really great that you're at this point now because it's winter yeah. and you have the boots and you have the mittens <laughs> and you have so this is the best time to get the cubby decision made. I mean, it's just so funny. Like, did you ask them if they need enough storage for their snow pants? Because sending their snow pants to school every day is a pain. <laughs> yeah. We did. There is. It's it, it's, it's incredible. It, it is at every single stage. The two, the two. Uh, providers that we're working with, our OPM and our architect, I mean, it's so clear how much experience they have with these projects, how much passion they have for oh. these projects. It, it, they go above and beyond. I mean, that Cubby story, as amazing as it is, it's, it's not surprising at this point <laughs> that they would go to that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So it's, it's been, uh, it, it's, yeah, it's been a great experience. Then. We got to Sorry, the I missed that one. Yeah. Color. We got to the exterior <laughs> color decision, and I was like, I want it to be brick, 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 because center school's brick, and they're like, but we're trying to meet the aesthetics of the land. And we're trying to fit into you know, nature. Said, well, okay, I just like bricks, but <laughs> you are the experts, and you have thought way more about this than I have in the five minutes that you, you know, shown us the rendering. So, but it was it was a unanimous <laughs> endorsement of option two. <laughs> if you're looking at the packet or whatever. But, um, so it was, it was a really good meeting. It was a two and a half hour meeting. That was a long. There was a lot of presentation, lots of discussion around. Playgrounds and yeah, the traffic light too. Oh, and the traffic, the traffic light. light. Yeah, there's going to be a traffic light at the where it meets Hayden Row. There was talk about oh. all the crosswalk and sidewalks, and I think there's still a lot of interplay with the highway department and the Department of Public Works. And a lot going on. I think our next. I don't remember when our next meeting. February. 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 Can I ask one question? Is there any talk about, you know, we've talked about in our capital articles, the bus parking lot um, and the storage shed. Is that coming up there? Because I'm hearing from 
I think, appropriations, but the Board of Selectmen doesn't want any capital articles related to that property that haven't been weighed on by weighed in on by the Irvine Todaro committee, which they haven't appointed a member of all the members. So I and that so that's impacting at least two of our capital articles. I was just wondering if you yeah, all that did not come up at all, the, the bus parking or the uh, storage, but they did talk about how the appointments, Pam had said that the appointments had finally just been made the night before. Oh okay. To that so I think maybe <coughs> that piece got wrapped up, but no, they're they're pretty focused on the exact scope of this project. So but can you really tell in the, in how quick the pace of this is if we're going to lose time, if we're not able to move those forward, if we have to wait until a year from now for those articles? Is that going to be too far down the road for some construction purposes? Or? I didn't look at an updated timeline last night. I don't remember when clearing and uh, Site work's going to start started. as soon as this initial site work's going to start as soon as this summer, I think. That's one of the reasons why we did see him at risk. So we have okay. But I just want to make okay. sure. There's, there's some potential scale that we could have if you needed to clear yep. more land yep. to do it at once, but I, I'm just anticipating if we're going to be asked to remove those articles or postpone so those articles we that might, we're not going to run into a right. trouble. We, we might in the sense of not getting the money, but we've had certainly initial approval conceptually. It's just that, as you point out, we can't move forward without right. the endorsement of that committee. But as far as CIC is concerned, they particularly like the bus parking lot. That yeah. was their very favorite. They just, understandably, none of us can commit to it until the committee has determined how they're going to use that. I property. just want to make sure, as a town, we're not cutting off our nose inside yeah. our face. Well, and it's it's actually it's so it is it is a worthwhile issue to raise because of the fact that if you think about it, if we did need to do additional clearing for the bus parking lot, that money would have to come from that capital article. We couldn't do it as part of the school project, right. and if we, we we would need a funding source to have the additional. Right. So and it's only going to be more expensive to go back a year later and absolutely clear the same, you know, twenty five. Bring all the equipment the in, same, whatever. Yep. So, at our any hands rate, are tight though. I feel like we put everything. We oh, can absolutely. Out right I just in terms of knowing our vision, and uh, now we can't do anything further <laughs> without that committee. But I think we your initial question out. from the school building committee perspective. Not a problem. We've stayed very, very tight for specific reasons on, as Kelly said, the school and the footprint of the school and, and, its, and its exterior, not the remainder of the land. I mean, so, it just yeah. jumped out at me. The yeah. pace that's is been. picking up so quickly that that's what yeah. really starts. Yeah. And know. I think this meeting really showed all the work that's gone in. Like, we were seeing renderings before in the envelope that we thought we were using. Now they're, they're out there doing a lot more if we move it 10 feet this way, 10 feet, so they're really narrowing down, and I think they've they've gotten to the point where they know exactly where that building's going to be. So when you have conversations about bus parking lots, it'll be they'll know exactly where we know where they go. Very good. I do. I, I and I'll try to be fast. Um, first, I wanted to uh, recognize the youth commission for the great MLK Day. I don't know if any of you had a chance to participate, but they had a great turnout on Monday, and they had people working, um, having a day on instead of a day off all across the town. And um, in addition, I wanted to recognize Denise Hildreth, who is our Director of Youth and Family Services, for the fantastic presentation last night. Um, there was a screening of the movie The Anonymous People and a really great panel that followed that. And just um, in looking forward, she's partnering with our friends who were sitting here to my left um, with the PTA to bring Chris Heron to the high school, uh, well, to speak with the kids and also have a parent meeting on um, March 17th. So that's something to put on your calendars. He's apparently a tremendous speaker, um, and so we're lucky to have him. Um, and then moving on, I also wanted to report out on the Charter Review Committee. We had our first meeting um, finally <coughs> last week, and we will be working towards getting the charter amendments on to the special town meeting warrant within this Springs town meeting. So hopefully we'll be discussing this in May. Um, so I will be out of town for our next meeting. So I wanted to announce tonight that on February 6th, um, we're planning to have a public forum to uh, for people to come and um, get an outline of what's in the current charter and get feedback on um, what changes they would like to make. But in particular, what I wanted to ask the four of you, or the six of you, um, one of the recommendations, uh, or tentative recommendations put forward by town council and the town manager is to move the 
submission date for the school budget up from February 1st to December 31st. Um, and there is a plan to interview committees and boards, but um, you know we have to all do that at the committee. So since we were here, I just I wanted to get your initial feedback on that, um, and so that I can represent what our committee's opinion is on that. That was the primary one that would impact our committee. And then in addition, if you have any other suggestions um, about amendments to the charter, certainly you can come to the forum or you can forward them to me and I'll, I'll bring them forward to the committee. Was did someone make the request to move it to December There 31st? was a list of topics to consider that um, the town manager and town council had compiled and that was one of many, but that was the one that was most directly relevant um, to the school committee. And well, if it's 1231 for the school committee, did they move up the budget no, no, message date? They didn't have anything that specific. They just wanted the school committee's number December 31st. Um, <coughs> consistent with the deadline for the other town departments other town to department. submit to the town manager, the That's ones that right. report to the town manager. That's right. <coughs> so are you seeking opinion on that? Certainly. Um, the past couple of years we've been consistent about having a directional number by 1231 just based on amendments to our own process. Um, in the span of January, consistently, we look to refine that number, hoping for more information from the town side about the <laughs> revenue picture and state aid, which we never get. Um, I, I can't imagine how there's any value at all in moving that date up. So for me, barring an argument that would show why there would be value in the process to moving that date up, I don't really see any particular reason to do it. So, so if we submit and then it just sits. Yeah. So I don't, it would just sit longer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, Unless there's we, changes, as you're yeah. saying, too. And we don't have enough feedback from the year before's budget, really, because that would move, right? That moves us up by at least a month. Mm -hmm. right. And because we'd have to have our public hearing before Christmas. Well, and the administrators would be starting in August, I think. Yeah. Okay. That would be really Before early. school opens with their next year. So budget. I think without like a substantial reason to move it up, I, I would say uh, I'm uh, not. In, I, it just seems like it makes no sense for us right now to say sure. I don't. I don't see a good reason. And, and even you know the argument to align it with the other town departments. The other town departments report to the town manager, and therefore he needs to consolidate them and look at the overall town side budget. <clears throat> while ours obviously has a significant impact to the overall levy, that process doesn't need to occur. Well, so it doesn't. The parallel is that all of our departments get their figures to the um, <coughs> superintendent well in advance of December thirty yeah. first because we're already reviewing it um, at that point. So yeah. the request so, seems okay. to make no so I, I have I, I have the general no. consensus. <laughs> No. That's a no, but I, I, I felt like I really needed to make sure that I asked um, so that I could represent appropriately what the opinion was. So thank you very much. Um, so I had an update on the CPAC meeting. That was on Tuesday night. Um, there were a number of questions that I believe had been sent to Dr. McLeod and Dr. Zaleski ahead of time, which. I unfortunately didn't follow due to death in the family, so I wasn't fully prepared with the questions ahead of time to know the content that was being discussed. But I, I think from a person sitting there and listening to the conversation, my overall perception is that there are still some communication issues to be worked out amongst the special education department and, and, and the parents direct with students that are directly impacted. Um, <laughs> I think that the group is definitely growing and and is is definitely looking for their not not just their feedback to be heard but i think also just for their um to be involved in the process and so you know i i think that it's becoming a, a much more dynamic group and um, a better dialogue that's going on but i i do I, I would still encourage us to put on the agenda and I don't know if February is going to work, but or March, but somewhere before the end of the year, some sort of update from Dr. Zaleski about what she found when she first came into the district, you know, where we are now and what her plan is okay. you know, in the coming time. I know we had talked about it briefly a few weeks ago about that same type of an update, mostly after the special education budget presentation ended up changing a bit, you know, after the fact. So. I, I don't have as much 
eyes on what's coming up in the next few months for agenda planning, but I would just encourage that that happen because I think it would I think it would allow for a, a little more direction, I think, for the school committee as to, you know, what's happening with the special education department now and um, and just what she's accomplished in her first year and, and for us to see to see that firsthand, I think that would be helpful. Um, because I know she's working very hard and a lot of the parents are definitely excited by her enthusiasm. Um, but I do think there are still challenges that are out there that um, are better to talk about than to, to leave unsaid. So um, so that's just my rep report on that. I, would, I will say that they, um, oh gosh, oh, so they were going to partner with Denise Hildreth to bring in a speaker. And originally they were trying to figure out, this was at the end of the meeting, they were trying to figure out a potentially special education related topic to have the, the, speak, the speaker brought in for. And then it basically came out that, you know, anxiety in children is this huge topic that whether you had a special education student or a general ed student, um, all parents would be, be interested in. So um, CPAC was willing to fund it if, you know, if funding was necessary for a speaker, but the, the, it seemed like it was heading in the direction of having Denise and both Dr. Zaleski speak on the how, what are the signs of anxiety in children from pre-K up to high school because we as parents may not know, um, you know, how it manifests itself and how it changes and what may be causing the anxiety. So that, uh, stay tuned because I'll have a date for that soon and it seemed like a very um, interesting program that they'd be putting on and I, I think the CPAC is really seeing what other towns are doing for um, having those types of speaker series and they're trying to move in that direction as well. So. Um, it was an ex that was an exciting talk at the end. So, yeah, I, you all set with liaison reports? Good. Um, do you guys mind if we move um, up new business items A and B since Mr. Bishop is here before we do um, the chair and the superintendent report? So, Mr. Bishop, <coughs> um, if you could join us, please. Welcome. Through Germany or? Okay. Yes. <laughs> so in our packet for our, <laughs> Thank you, sir. for our consideration is the request and recommendation of the superintendent to improve the intent to travel request for a Germany-Italy trip and an Amsterdam-Paris trip. Or are those four different trips? Two. Two trips, yeah. Okay, that's right. So the, um, the information has been in your packet for you to review. Uh, prior to tonight's meeting, um, that's for the next <coughs> oh, yep. item. And um, I wanted to add, or before any discussion, um, that Mr. Bishop is here to um, answer any of your questions. But before we do, I do want you to know that there is a third trip. Um, as we <coughs> have organized last year, we wanted to make sure that all trips would come for your consideration. <coughs> Initial approval, right? Um, for 2017 at the same time, initially we had a proposal that Mr. Bishop and I were not comfortable supporting because it required students to miss three days of school. Um, so the organizer did go back and um, Lauren Polanski and did provide us with an updated request that did not make it into the packet for this time. So it will be on for February 4th, but I did want you to know and the community to know that there are three trips that will be proposed for the high school for 2017 and the third trip that we'll bring back to you on February 4th for initial approval is to Cuba. So with that, I'll go back to the initial um, consideration um, that we're, we're looking at tonight is Germany um, and Amsterdam. Questions uh, with respect to the Germany-Italy trip from July 1 to July 10th? I have one question for both that's the same question. I, um, you don't have to talk about it for the other one if you don't want to. <laughs> but I, so I see we were handed the sheet about um, travel alerts and I guess my question was just overall security. That's the only thing that appeared missing in the packet was any discussion about security and what what security is offered for you know our students and our, our group. Does a tour group have security? Like, And 
I, I don't, security is such a broad word, so I, you know, I'm not talking about like a personal guard for each student, but like, how are they, how, how do they tackle security, what, you know? Yeah, that's a good question, I know that they don't probably have like a security guard with the group, but uh, <laughs> very seriously, I actually spoke with uh, a representative from EF, which is Education First, it's the company that we do most of our travel with just today. Um, and she shared with me this, this handout that I wanted to give to you. And we've talked to them quite a bit with our trips that are this current school year um, with the safety travel alerts and the travel warnings. And, um, and, you know, and they assure us as much as they can that they're putting as much effort into it as, as possible to make sure that everybody's safe on the trip. Um, they've offered to come and meet with our parents, meet with our kids, meet with our teachers. Uh, so it's a great organization. Uh, they were telling me that less than 2% of schools that work with them have changed their plans since the attacks in Paris. I think people want to continue to travel, they want to continue to do what they've been doing, but that's a legitimate question. Um, and it's something that we have to be very cautious and, and keep up with the travel alerts and the travel warnings. And if things happen close to the time of the trip, they've been very flexible in allowing people to cancel their trips and amend the trips. So that necessarily wasn't the case before some of this stuff. And so I think that they've, they're working with schools, uh, but certainly safety is a topic that we, we bring up every time we meet with the parents and kids on these trips. So one other follow-up to that, Mr. Yeah. Bishop, and this just came to me, so I wouldn't even have been able to say it to you then, but I, I, I'm under, if, I don't have a student in high school yet, so I haven't had to be through any kind of preparation for these trips, but I assume that there's some sort of orientation, information sessions for parents. Is there any thought been put into um, educating the students a bit on <laughs> what to look for to keep yourself safe when you're in another country? Because for many kids, they may never have traveled without their parents or sure. outside the country before to even have a sense of what should I be looking for, you know? And so I just, I, it's more of just a suggestion that maybe that's something to be taken into consideration during some of these informational meetings that there may be an opportunity to educate the students a little bit on what, how to be aware of. Sure, I, and I think that we've started that process. And, and we do have uh, multiple meetings. There's an orientation, but there's also a few me other meetings leading up to the trip. And, and safety is certainly something that is continually talked about at these. Uh, and so I think your suggestion is a good one. I know Charlotte Shire is in the audience here. She's, she's taking the trip to uh, Germany and northern Italy, and they've already had these conversations with the kids as much as they can. And just she's to make done sure many other right. trips. She has. Well. She's, yeah, I mean, the, the trip that she's going on, all of them are, are excellent, but it's a a global student leadership summit and we've sent kids to this summit two other times once in 2013 in Costa Rica if you guys remember and uh, once in 2015 last year to, to um, Switzerland and it's just a great opportunity I mean the kids are are uh, put together with students from all over North America and all over Europe and um, they get framed a question they don't know what the question is but they work in these large groups and, and uh, they identify a problem and come up with a solution and try to think outside the box and I just think it's a a wonderful opportunity for our students and, and Charlotte has certainly raved about her experience over there as well so um, but all the trips are excellent I don't want to just pick on this one but she's here so. <laughs> <laughs> so are we talking about both of them or just first well since Lori wanted to talk about both you can talk about either trip it's important we know who to blame <laughs> <laughs> So I, I don't have a question on the first one. It's on the second one sure. that um, it's the Brussels <coughs> portion of it that I didn't really understand. Or so it appears that there we're we're part of a tour, but that doesn't include the <coughs> Brussels portion, and that's just sort of it's on the way. So we're taking advantage of that fact. So how does that change the management of the trip? The the um, does that make the, the, I assume when we engage in these study tours, yep. the tour companies take on a lot of the responsibility, a lot of the liability, they take out, they take out and yet it, yeah. it seems like that Brussels section is definitely different than. It's different, but there's still, from my understanding, and I can get back to you on this, from my understanding, there still will be people with us from EF. From EF, okay. So even though it's not specific in the tour brochure, EF is extending, yes. okay, yes, okay. Yes, that, yep. okay. Anyone else? Okay, there's a motion before you. Um, would anyone like to make a motion? I'll move to <coughs> approve the intent to travel requests for Germany and Italy July 1st to July 10th, 2017. And um, we should probably say Brussels, Amsterdam, Paris, April 15th to April 22nd, 2017, right? Second. Okay. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Bertrand. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Unanimous and so carries. And now Mr. Bishop, he wants more. <laughs> for our consideration is 
The request and recommendation of the superintendent to approve the request to reallocate stipend money, I think it was from the fashion club towards the supporting the Spartan club. Are there any questions or comments on the recommended motion before you? Okay, I would seek a motion to approve the reallocation of $500 from the high school fashion club to the high school Spartan club. You got it. Second. Motion by Ms. Birchman, second by Mr. Graziano. All those in favor? Yes? Yes. yes. Unanimous and so carries. I want to join the club. I know. It's I nice. know. So they were at, I wanted to bring pitches, uh, but last November. Did you want to talk more about it? Did I just yeah, cut, I I cut no, off like, well, the whole? I was ready. <laughs> uh, the, 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 um, <laughs> we're about we, speed here. We're, I know, which I, which I we're more efficient so than you're used to. I don't want to slow you down. <laughs> I, yes, wish, but, yeah, I wish I knew they were there. I yeah. was there in November. In, Fen in Fenway? I, I did yeah, we had about 22 kids, and Miss Millette, one of our wellness teachers who felt certified, was with them, and they had a blast. It's a... They, they take it very serious, the workouts after school, the nutrition piece, it's a, it's a close-knit group, so I, I felt it was important to try to fund this. So. That's great. great. Wish them luck. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Thank you. Okay, so back to the school committee chair report. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing in front of me is the, the change of our calendar with respect to meetings in June. Um, and I know there's been some email exchanges, and currently we were were scheduled to meet. The, we were scheduled to meet ninth the ninth and the twenty third. And the twenty third, and the I don't know consideration is whether to move that to the second and the sixteenth, or do the sixteenth and the thirtieth, or uh, some right. combination. So I have a my daughter's graduating finally. <laughs> Um, and <laughs> She's probably not watching. And, uh, it's a great celebration in our family, and uh, it, it is taking place in Toronto, and it's on the 9th of June. So um, for that reason, I had reached out to you to see if we could reschedule our pr June uh, meetings. The, uh, obviously, if we were to meet on the 2nd, we would have back-to-back -back meetings. We will have a new school committee member at that point, so we need to consider that fact. That the, I think the 26th would be their first meeting. Yes. Yeah. So it would be back-to-back -back meetings for a new member. Um, if we were to wait and have the meetings on the 16th <coughs> and the 30th, then um, there would be, we, we might have to worry about warrants being signed in between. So I leave it to you. I, I personally would rather do the 16th and 30th and have the three weeks and worry about the warrants because I feel like May in the beginning of June with school activities right. is heavy. So long. That was my I think that's 16th and 30th. And then that way we know that at the end of the fiscal year, if we have issues, we'll be meeting and we can take care of them in time for that um, with budget transfers and things of that mm -hmm. nature. Um, I think it's easy enough for us to get more in signs if there's a need during that time period. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I don't. I think the warrants aren't aren't a huge stumbling block, but. The other things we usually do at that time are like <coughs> studies and student handbooks and <coughs> so that we're not just we're we're one of these meetings. planning thoughtfully and we're not holding them up for some particular reason. We also have graduation on the third and I know that right. school, there used to be a conflict on the second because right. but we no longer have a conflict. So uh, Janine and I have been looking at next year's calendar so that when we bring the school year calendar we don't have a conflict in September on back to school nights right so we're trying to think about all of that but the Thursday is no longer a problem because the high school is working around that um, so whatever you I, I know that graduation also largely takes care of the warrant issue because we'll all well, be together there you go yeah. that's and we noticed that Miss Gordino has pulled herself out of this conversation quite delightfully <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the 16th and the 30th makes sense yep. because we can take care of the warrants and I think the operational reason Lori that you cited around end of fiscal year yeah. uh, we end up trying to throw together a meeting towards okay. the 30th all the time anyway so let's just know we have that meeting on the 30th and we can okay. give Mr. Dumas as much time as possible to wrap up everything we need to and be ready to vote on the 30th. <coughs> Dean I think I only haven't heard from you. No I th that's it. that's yep okay. I said that's fine. I'm changing it right now, so I don't. Right now. So I don't. <laughs> I'll be sending it to you. Otherwise, <laughs> next up, superintendent's report. What? Um, thank you. I will um, quickly reference um, a professional development plan. Uh, something that Ellen and I had talked about is to make it a point of reporting out to the school committee 
following professional development days, the kinds of things that have taken place. So I will do that going forward as part of my report um, to the school committee. And so you can see under J January 15th, which was our, our most recent early release day, um, the variety of activities taking place, which is in the middle of the page that, that is in front of you. Um, at the high school, the focus was on school the in school, school improvement plan goal of developing quality formative assessments. And this has been a real focus of the high school this year, so that they have consistent formative assessments to inform instruction, um, with the idea being that we've talked a lot about the differences between formative and summative, and how we need to have assessments that don't just happen after the learning, but also happen before the learning, so that we know what we can focus on. So that was how they spent their day. At the middle school, um, you can see a variety of departments did a variety of things, um, which I, I'm always really happy to see this because sometimes a, um, a professional development day will happen and people will say, well, what did, what did the related arts people do? What did you know, um, the counseling department do? And so you can see that there were very specific things happening in each department. Um, the science department, for example, is looking very carefully to be out in front, the introduction to next generation science standards. And you know from our discussions with the strategic plan that th that's exactly in line with, the, the, what, with what we need to be doing this year to prepare for next year. Um, at the Hopkins, they wanted to be able to start to look and prepare their students for the differences between anticipated park exemplars and uh, park-like items on the upcoming MCAS. We know and have been recently notified that students are going to be provided with this year a timed portion and an untimed portion. Mm -hmm. Up until now there has not been a timed portion on MCAS. So there's some differences that are happening and they've been starting to talk about what are some of these exemplars so that as part of the course of instruction, teachers can start exposing students to those. Um, I just want to stress that that doesn't mean as people will refer to teaching to the test. That, that, that's not the idea. The idea is that if you are being asked to apply your thinking, you've just read an excerpt, and you're being asked to apply that in your writing document, that, that's instruction. And so those are the park-like types of applications that students are going to be asked to do that they haven't been asked to do in the past. And um, finally, along that line, they're no longer going to be asked to participate in the long comp in fourth grade because we're going to be asking kids to demonstrate their writing ability in open response questions across the content. So that's a great step forward um, because before that open response was really a reading comp. It was considered a reading comprehension assessment and now they're looking at, at it as a writing assessment. So those are all um, things that they did. At the Elmwood School they broke it down by grade level and this was one of the teachers common planning times where they're able to drive um, the, the agenda. Um, one of the things that we're looking to do in next year's professional development um, planning, which we've started, is to have district-wide common planning. <coughs> that if we want to pull teachers together for professional development on an early release day, we know that one school is having common planning and another school is not. We're looking for consistency across that. Um, Finally, in a more overall uh, report in terms of major professional development initiatives, I've listed them at the beginning of the report. Um, the focus K-8 has been on math instruction. Um, I, wanna, I want to um, reinforce that these are all aligned with what we have stated in the strategic plan. Grades 2-3, they took on the self-regulated strategies development, the SRSD. Um, writing approach that we started in center last year, K-1, has now been taken forward to the 2-3 the, the building at the Elmwood School. Um, and then an ongoing focus for the entire year has been examining student data. Um, and you, you hear me talk about it way too much, but really what are we doing with the data? So we've got the data, and how, how are we using it to inform instruction? Um, Kelly and Lori heard me talking about that at CPAC uh, the other night as well. Um, and then we've begun a district-wide training on de-escalation. The uh, department has come out with new regulations on restraint, and they were to be put in place January 1. What we have put in place, which is, I believe, very unique to our district, is a district-wide de-escalation training for not only teachers, but um, 
administration. So I want the entire administrative staff to be trained on what does this look like? When I go into a classroom as a principal and I'm doing an observation, or I see a student in crisis in the hallway, and I see an individual, a teacher, paraprofessional, working with that student, what should I be seeing? And so we are all participating. It's a 12-hour training, um, including myself, in de-escalation safety care training that Karen Jewett, we're, we're um, going to be contracting with her through ACCEPT and bring her back to do the training because she's done the training with the teachers. And we want the same person providing the same, the same message. Um, I believe that this is just as important um, and goes hand in hand with restraint because if we are doing a better job at de-escalating we should be seeing a significant reduction in the numbers of restraints um, and the goal as Karen stated in a former district was to get to zero um, so those are all the things going on with professional development we've been very busy um, and 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 they're very very focused those those times those release times from school are so precious um, we don't waste a minute of it. Um, questions, or do you want me to just keep going? Okay. Um, I want to make an announcement, and this will be a press release. This has to do with the coordinated program review, and um, the cro we have been we are have, have been in the process of providing uh, preparing for the coordinated program review. These department staff will be visiting the district the week of March the 14th through the 18th. So we've been preparing all of the documents that they're requiring. They, those have been submitted. They will be coming um, during those dates to interview selected individuals that they've requested. Um, they are reviewing um, three programs within our district, special education, English learner education, civil rights, and other general education requirements. So they met with us last week. They provided us with a list of interviews that they want to be conducting that week with the exit interview to take place on the 17th. On the 17th, they'll be providing us with their findings, and then we will be provided with a, the school department, the um, school committee, and the superintendent will be provided with any corrective actions that need to take place and a window of time during which we can provide any corrective action plans. Um, what I will be um, releasing in this press release is, and I wanted to announce tonight, and I will read this to you. Any member of the public may request to be interviewed by telephone by a member of the department's visiting team. Those wishing to, to be interviewed should call the superintendent's office no later than January 30th um, to leave their name and phone number. Or they may call the department directly and that phone number will be provided as well. So um, I wanted to just alert you to the fact that this press release is going out, but I think it's important to the community that they are aware of what's taking place with coordinated program, why we're doing it, where we are, and then if they want to be involved, they have that opportunity. Okay. Um, the preschool lottery, like last year, you, um, I'm going to read this. Applications for the pre-kindergarten are due February 1st. The lottery for the three-year-old program and waiting list for four-year-olds will be held on February 25th. Just prior to the school committee meeting, it will be televised. It'll take place at 6.45, just prior to the meeting. Um, we have followed up with HCAM to confirm that. That began last year for the first time, and it was a request that was made of, of parents who um, wanted to be, again, um, to increase transparency on that process, that it's done openly and in public. So that's a big announcement that's out there for preschool. And we did the June school committee dates. So the final part of my report is to, um, to provide the overview which you have been provided with the, the superintendent's mid-cycle goals review. It is and has been in the packet that has been uh, provided to the public so everybody has access to it. Um, I'm not going to read it to you because you've had it. So I think that unless you want me to comment on it, on what my goals specifically were, that I would open it up to your feedback. Thanks. So I think this is, um, we, we've done this now, it's our third January doing this, um, an opportunity to have looked at the evidence and look at the key action items with respect to each goal and to have a candid conversation with Dr. McLeod with respect to 
what we might think is missing, what we think is well established, um, and, and sort of give her ideas of where to go from here so that she ends up in a, a positive place and, and we're all flying in the same direction by the end of your review. Exactly. So I don't know, anyone want to start? Um, <coughs> no, I, I, can, I can, I mean, I, I feel like I never have to start, which might be a benefit, but. <laughs> I can it's good about being chair. What? It's just good about being chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for all the evidence that was in there. It was, it was great. Um, and, <coughs> and I thought it was very well organized. Um, as I, I actually <laughs> probably did it backwards. I went through all the evidence first, and then I went back to the goals so that I could have in my head what I looked at and then um, see what, what I thought either I would like to see more of or, or it may be something that you're still working on and it, it's not you know, evident yet. Okay. But the first, um, <coughs> your first goal in regards to um, demonstrating strong interpersonal written and verbal communication skills in number two of the key actions, it was the uh, clear rationale for decisions to include admin counsel. And I, I guess what I saw, I definitely saw admin counsel, um, and I don't know, how, and, I, and I don't have a lot of advice, I guess, on how to demonstrate rationale, but I'm, I'm wondering in terms of, maybe you can clarify for me what you thought provided the evidence for rationale or like where the decision making mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. That's where I, I felt like there may be yeah, some room there. Okay. It's hard, um, you know, in terms of this is why this is a good conversation, in terms of giving you the evidence that sometimes I assume is clear, um, that the admin council meetings, because we keep running minutes and because you, I provided you with a couple of examples of yep. the admin, was to show you the kinds of things we talk about during those meetings okay. um, and that they're collaborative and we have discussions about these kinds of things. Um, for a, a, a good example is the calendar. They never used to weigh in on the calendar. The admin council, they, they, this would be kind of just handed to them. And so that's an example of something that it's your calendar. I bring it to you for your approval, but I bring it to you after I've had input from them because I think that, that they, have to, they have to be able to fit within, you know, the recommendations. So, um, for me, that's an example about decision making around those okay. recommendations. Um, I wrote calendar discussion. The strategic plan priorities, um, you saw an example of it last year. You'll continue to see it this year where I go back to the strategic plan. I report back on where we are, but I do that with their input because they can say to me, you know what, Kathy, we need more time on this. Or, um, you know, it looks like we thought we were going to get to that, but this took more time than we thought, so we're not going to get to that. So it's not done in a vacuum in my office. Yes. But if there, th those are examples I could certainly think of. Uh, well, no, I saw, I saw the admin council mm -hmm. um, minutes, and I thought those were very interesting, honestly, because I, I hadn't seen anything about them before. So I just don't think I was making the leap. So, and that's fine. I just was trying. Mm -hmm. For you clarifying that for me is fine. I just wanted to understand if that that was the purpose behind okay. those. Um, the in the same communication on the next page of our and I'm sorry because I don't know do you have them open <laughs> your goals you do okay. um, on page three there's a, there's a number five where it talks about the superintendent <laughs> student advisory yeah. and that was what I was wondering what the status was on that or if there was any yeah. evidence that I missed regarding no. That. So I wrote to do there because I haven't started it. Um, so um, one of the things I've started this month, and my first one was when I was referencing Elmwood today, was to the, the listening walk idea. Um, when I tried listening before we had, we had completed negotiations, um, there, there wasn't anyone visiting. So um, I started again today, and I had a wonderful visit to the Elmwood School, and just I must have spoken with 30 different people throughout that two-hour block. So that's what's happening um, that I've started this month, and I have uh, scheduled plans to every building by before the end of this month, the same idea. Um, the next piece, and I know I spoke with you before about meeting with students, and I had photographs of different groups of students, um, <laughs> is that was kind of just to meet the superintendent. I want to now 
actually sit down at this point in the year and meet with students at each of the buildings and just listen to them, the things that they love about their building, the things that are of concern to them. Um, and, I, and, I, and I want to reach out and, and figure out with, with Evan and with, with guidance how I can get to a group of students who might be willing to talk about bullying um, with me because um, I know that it's happening and it's not being reported and it worries me a great deal. Um, so there are things like that that um, what I write to do and I don't have current evidence it's because it, I haven't gotten to it. I'm sorry because when I read the parentheses I was thinking that those were notice <laughs> notes you had from when we initially did this over the no. summer which doesn't make any sense no. but now I am clear on that because actually okay. I had written next to it where is the status and then to do makes perfect sense so okay. excuse me for not understanding that so then the next goal under goal two where um, it talks about collecting evidence of efficacy of special educational instruction. Yep. Um, and I know that's in, pro in process. Yep. In terms of, it, was there evidence presented to us in, in that realm or is that because it's in process and we no. don't have that evidence yet? Oh, you don't and I'm glad you're asking about it. So this is something, this whole area to me under student learning, the adjustment to practice, um, a variety of formal and informal methods and assessments to measure student learning growth and adjustment to their practice when students are not learning. We are right at that point right now. So we've got assessments from the beginning of the year, we're now comparing them at this point in the year and we're starting the conversations. They're happening mostly during PLCs with teachers in very collaborative manners, sharing ideas, um, shared responsibility for students who may be struggling, and, and I've been listening to teachers having conversations about, oh, you know, I tried this and it was really helpful, or I have a student with similar needs, maybe we could, they could have a joint group, and so those are, we're at that point in the year where that's beginning, and that is going to be a big focus in terms of evidence in, in my end of year, um, and, and I'm collecting it between now and the end of the year, because that's kind of the point that we're at, so I don't have a lot of evidence to date except for anecdotally what I've seen in my visits to the schools. Okay? Um, this year has not been a year of public forum. I know. <laughs> I know. Well, you I know mean, what? I guess I thought that, and then I thought, but all the building. Well, I made, gave you that whole schedule. Yeah. Because yeah, well, I, I mean, was saying that roadshow, yeah. Was like 20 that, of them, but yeah. it was just all on one time. But she has the roadshows in here, and so, because, like, obviously with the community port, mm -hmm. portion of it, I mean, that was huge. It was yeah. huge. And, and as I was thinking about it, as I was going <clears> through this, I thought the same thing. And then I thought, well, what would have the topics have been that would have been um, of interest to people? Um, and I did think of one that's coming up. We had talked. Uh, we had talked a while back. Uh, you and I talked about the whole student data. Um, we did usage and but I, but I think fundamentally wh when, I, just when, when I looked at it too though is is that I don't know where where they would have fit. Well, they're doing them at the building so level. Many. Oh, yeah. The, so that's the thing, right? Yeah. The principals have taken that on yeah. this year as having those forums with parents, um, yeah. and and sharing data in a way that hasn't happened before. Um, I don't know. I mean, I am. As you know, always happy. Oh, I know what we're, we're going to be doing, and we're doing a public forum. Um, that's what came to mind as I was thinking about this. We're going to be doing state of the schools quite differently, mm -hmm. and it's going to be in the in the format of a forum. Um, so I met with Aaron and Tara, and we talked about you know the list of questions that they were receiving for state of the schools, and we started talking about. I wonder why do we do it this way? Because it feels a little like these are anonymous questions, and they're questions that. These questions perhaps could have come during our budget process and been directed during public comment. <coughs> Tara had an interesting point, and she said, "You know, I think that all began before we were televising all of the all of the budget meetings. That's true. Yeah. Which was a new thing that I started um, every uh, televising all of them. Right. So we started to say, well, maybe it would be more relaxing and and more people would feel less, you know, defensive or whatever, nervous." If it was just a non-televised opportunity, still state of the schools, conversation about where things are, where we're going, Q&A with parents and myself and Ellen, and we've 
<laughs> identified a couple of nights, um, evening slots, but we also would like to provide a daytime slot. Mm -hmm. So that's, I kind of thought, well, that that's a forum. Mm -hmm. That's that's right. an example. Um, and, and it's actually not topic driven, right? It opens it up to whatever topic. It does. Depends. Yeah. I'm going to talk about. Um, and the only other question I had was, I know you sa it says that you've completed the build in building maintenance plan and included preventative maintenance plans. That's the only thing I wasn't sure. You didn't I, see it? In and I might have missed it, but um, is that in the community folder? It should be in the, no, in the one called With operational yeah, system. Yeah. Spreadsheet. Oh, I did see that. Okay. I'm the worst spreadsheet reader, so I probably missed well, what I was getting. Well, that, that had never been something that we had. So not only for tracking progress on initiatives, but also for reporting back to principals on this is where it's at. Um, it, it's really around improving communication so that they know, no, you haven't heard from me. It's not because, enough, you know, this is where it is in the process. Um, I... You know, all credit to Al. There's been great improvement around um, timeliness about his ability to delegate responsibility. Um, he just he knows it all, so he's the first one to want to jump in and help because that's who he is. Um, but it was resulting in him just not being able to be everywhere at once. And so there's been a lot of improvements around that, around communication. Uh, up until the situation last night, um, we haven't had any mm -hmm. unexpected um, situations this year. Um, and so I think those methods of, of tracking things and making people aware and then the delegation of responsibility has been changed as well so that principals know they don't all have to go to Al. There are things that are, there were <laughs> levels of concerns that were communicated out in one of those memos, levels A, B, and C. You know, level A goes straight to Al and to me, but the other levels go to different people. Um, so those are all parts of that. That was all I had. Okay, thank you, because I, I have to say my favorite part was reading the communications from teachers. And yeah, so I got that idea from somebody I was evaluating. It never occurred to me to do that, so I started doing it, because it's amazing how it, how it builds. Um, when I saw it in that individual's, you know, you can read a bunch of emails, or you can read excerpts under different, you know, back and forth. And of course, you don't see those things. So you get your own emails about me um, and about my work, but you don't see those kinds of communications. So I'll continue to do that. I'll kind of cut it off where it is and date it differently so you can see the new things. But um, I try to be mindful of, of taking snippets of those different, very kind. Um, <laughs> So I got one just today after the Elmwood visit that I will that I will include in there that that gives you the feedback for the kinds of things that I tell you I do. So go down the table. Okay. If you want to go next, I'll go next. So I liked hearing how Lori approached this because I did it a little differently. So I saw this sheet and then I just brainstormed what I thought you had done, and then I went to the evidence to see if I found ah things that matched. So when I first went into the communication. Um, you know, the first thing that came up was the ESBC, the road show. I just know that that was absolutely exhausting. And every single night, it seemed like you were in a different location with a different group of people talking. Um, so I thought that that was a great uh, evidence point around the communication. And I, I thought about the calendar group. Um, just These are just my, my notes. So you're so quick on your email responses. I think that that's... I don't know how you find the time. I, I wrote surprising availability. I mean, it's just, I know you're doing a thousand things, but yet you can still count on within a certain amount of time. You'll get a phone call back or an email back or even time for a meeting in person. So I think that that really speaks to interpersonal you know, skills. You obviously have very, very good time management because I can imagine that it would be very easy to be more google on your <coughs> Outlook calendar or whatever. Google Calendar that you see every day. Um, because of last night, the one thing that I did think of was because the social media gets to us a lot, just making sure you get to us first. So that, but I, we've already covered that. But we have, and and yeah, just top of mind because of. And I and I and I appreciate the feedback on that. Yeah. Um, 
That's what I had inside of the communication. I, I agreed once then I read through your, your things. So I was like, oh, right, 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 principal newsletters. We did get those. I, I don't know about all the other buildings, but I saw in the evidence that somebody, somebody must have responded and said, oh, this is awesome. Now I'm seeing mm -hmm. uh, newsletters from my school. I've, I've gotten them, so I haven't, didn't have anything to complain on that part. Um, the communication around clear decision making, I was very impressed with the world language one specifically because at the end of the day, we made a decision that didn't follow what everyone thought, like we were going down a path, we were going towards implementation, and then we say, hold on, you know, we have different district goals, we need to focus on ELA, we need to focus on the things that we already do and making a decision for a point. I felt like last year maybe it was more of a budgetary decision and this year it was more of a, this is just not right right now. So I think the input that you got and the people that you had come to present, you know, it was a very compelling argument for it. But at the end of the day, you have to make those decisions on, on what we do and why. And I thought that that was a really good example of a thoughtful follow-up. I wrote, good presentation, thoughtful follow-up as to not the best time given the priorities. So we didn't do it just to do it, but to make people happy that we were for my mission. I thought that was really good. Um, I didn't know what the superintendent's student advisory was. You already touched on that. Yeah. Okay. It hasn't right. happened yet. That's okay. So, yeah. um, I noticed that the unannounced visits on the evidence were lower than yep. the announced visits. And yep. I know you've talked about the listening to listening walks, but yeah. the unannounced visits for the people who report to you are you going to be? Yeah, so that that's a very good point, and that really does need to. I mean, I did very little of it last year, and had I stayed. Think there were two. Yeah, two and, had one and that was it. on on this year's. Yeah, yeah. Two in um, so I have one tomorrow. Um, yeah, it it was it's as you point out, it's it's a time piece, and the interesting thing, and we all talk about this, all of us about evaluation, is when. There's a slot on the cal on my calendar that says, you know, wherever I'm visiting that day unannounced, and then things are piling up. It's really easy <laughs> not yeah. to do it because nobody's expecting me. Oh, and so right. that's my challenge, my own personal challenge, when you say about balancing everything. Those blocks, the very reason that they're unannounced, it's very easy to go, oh, okay, I just can't do that today. Yeah, um, but I that. do, I really want to make it a priority. Um, now that we are where we are with the building project and that's not consuming me the way it was, um, I really want to make that a priority. It, it gives, it doesn't ever give me any surprises, which is really reassuring. I've not, I mean, sometimes I go just to go and it, it's not because I'm writing things up. I never walk into a building and I'm like, oh my goodness, like what's going on in here? That's the, the idea of an unannounced is that, you know, this is business as usual. This is what you always get no matter when you walk in. Um, so I will make it a goal to, to um, increase those. The announced are always the ones that are going to involve meetings where I'm going to be going with a principal who's working with a group of teachers, specifically around a topic that I want to observe, like adjustment to practice. So those have to be planned. Um, okay. Thank you. And then I thought it was interesting your, your response to Lori around the listening walks when you're talking about those yeah. and the fact that contract negotiations really no. put a damper on being able to... <laughs> Well, I was willing to listen, but yeah, <laughs> there was nothing to listen to. No one was talking. Yeah. Um, so around the student learning goals, I, I have just some general thoughts. This is a lot of work for which, to the point you guys already discussed, there's not a ton of evidence because it's all so ongoing. So I, I just wrote a note. I'm a bit worried that the end of the school year comes fast. Yep. And your your formal review comes quickly and. Mm -hmm. uh, just being able to, if you could incrementally add evidence on these, okay. that'd be good because if we're looking at evidence around every single one of these in that short time frame, yep. that's going to be tough to absorb. So okay. as soon as things are available, if you could just shoot us an email that, hey, you know, I, I got some evidence around differentiated interventions for students, or okay. I circled the same one that collect evidence of efficacy, yep. such as teachers, you know, just feed it to us in pieces and not um, at the end so that it's easier to, sure. to absorb. And I know that um, Dr. Zaleski t talks about data a lot, a lot about data, so hopefully we can leverage some of the data that she's pulling up too. Um, around the operational systems, so I know that um, towards the beginning of the year we met 
um, with a member of the community who actually randomly is here tonight, and we didn't plan this, um, to talk about building. Didn't the recognize lab. you without your hat on. Uh, <laughs> without her layers. <laughs> <laughs> I think she was wearing more layers. I think so. Than she's wearing now. Um, so we did a walk around the grounds and talked about things. So you were very involved and everything, but it still seems like maybe some follow through with the buildings and grounds. Um, I know that we've had a couple emails back and forth around, you know, Gary Bleacher's still there, you know, just kind of, Gary Bleacher's still there, so maybe a little more around, mm -hmm. you're great at engaging and everything, but the, the follow-up mm -hmm. from those efforts, I think. So when I heard from Peggy, great. when we heard from Peggy as a follow-up <laughs> to, to the ongoing um, litter, um, I did follow up, and I, and I followed up very very firmly yeah. in terms of how disappointing and actually embarrassing this is. Right. Um, we have since inst uh, installed, provided additional trash cans because one of the, the comments that w I received back was, you know, it's not just our kids that are using these grounds. People are walking constantly. And if there's not enough trash barrels for people to put their trash, we can't necessarily say that this is all being generated from students who are parking. However, I met with Mike Zecco and Donnie, and we were in the front of the parking lot, and they were showing me pictures of um, student, student trash in the bus lot with a garbage can. I mean, I took a picture and took it into Evan because the trash was here and the garbage can was where that microphone was, and I said, this is not acceptable. And that's the other point we, that I made, was that I know you went to Evan and you got some high school yeah, engagement. And then they got rained out. The yeah. For yeah. The so, sure. so I have, um, and I and the, the comment that I've made back to to Mike and Donnie is, I don't I don't pick this up. Do not pick this up. The take away the scary bleachers. <laughs> well, I think they're gone. I, don't, I was asking Peggy if they're the scary bleachers. I think they went. Like the ones on Lot C. By the by the by the lacrosse field. Not the track, the lacrosse field. Uh, yeah, ten. Ten. That's J Lot. That's J Lot. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that's where they store the bleachers. Those no, are the no, 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 no. These are Three. these are broken down. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So J Lot and field ten. Um, but but I just I want to reinforce and not leave the student responsibility part of this is because. You know, we have really great kids, and they are provided with a really wonderful program. And part for me is taking responsibility and sharing in the, you know, respect for their school. Right. And, and so use the trash cans. And if you're not using the trash cans, then we'll have a group of you go out and, and pick it up. Because um, for me to see our custodians picking up student trash that where the trash can's right there is, is not a good message for us to send to our kids. Um, so on both levels, I want you to know that I haven't, I, it wasn't one and done, and I'm not, and I do appreciate the ongoing follow-up because unless I'm going to be driving it myself, <laughs> I won't necessarily know that it hasn't been taken care of. And then goal four, I just circled it and I said strength because I think community and business engagement is where you really do shine. So that's all I have. Thank okay, you. thank you, Kelly. Um, so I said a, a few additional things to what's already been provided. I I, um, I really did like the the evidence with respect to communication because I, uh, around the building project because I think that's a highlight that we can't do enough to to raise because you I, again attended some number I lost count of public forums um, to ensure that the message was out there about that school, um, which was such a critical goal for us this year. So. Um, one thing that I would have, I know there was a note in that collection of communications about newsletters, but that's, I know that it's been a top, the consistency of, of mm -hmm. school-based communications has been a topic that that drove this goal in right. part, and there wasn't a lot of evidence in there of oh, it. Now, okay. indirect, albeit, because yeah. you're not the one producing those newsletters, yeah. I, I, I subscribe for my own information to all of the listservs, so yeah. I get them all now, and I yeah. can see the growing consistency, and so I think that that evidence... Okay. Um, would be worth highlighting. Good Even idea. though it's not your hand that's drafting them, it is a result of the initiative and the goal that, that you have um, that you have in here. Um, I, I really do want to highlight, I think that the 
the information you provided on the facilities goal. Um, I, we, I know how much work you've done with respect to that, but at the same time, it, to see it all really outlines the amount of work um, that has gone into that. Um, the student learning goal, um, I agree with Kelly that that can probably run the risk of getting away from us. Um, one thing that I would highlight that worked really well last year that I think plays right into this is the report that you did towards the springtime about performance. I know it was specifically framed around co-teaching and full-day kindergarten, but I thought that was a tremendous illustration of okay. student growth um, and something like that, both at a school committee meeting and also for your own evidence, I think would hmm. be a good way Great. Um, to display that. So, so okay. um, looking forward to that. Um, just looking that at my notes. I might end up having a triple purpose because um, when we have to present our budget at town meeting, having that evidence is always helpful and right. nice last year. Right. So I, I would I would say that that actually would be useful. Do it in April. Okay. Um, I also think that um, as, and I'm, I'm have it in my notes, so I don't actually remember which <laughs> goal this goes under, but probably the operational one. Um, it may be sort of fresh pain from what we went through last year around school safety and security, um, but just additional evidence around your leadership. Um, for that because I know how much work you do to ensure that we have an aligned plan for school safety and security with all of our public safety officials. Um, you know, obviously this is last year, but, but last year you took such a leadership role in even communicating it as we approached yeah. the budget about what we were trying to do even yeah. though it was a joint effort. Um, so I, I think that that's a really important topic and obviously articulated in here, so I okay. think more evidence to support that would also be um, would also be effective. Um, I think that I think it's all the additional that I had at the moment. Thank you. Well, and I'm, I'll make every effort not to restate what has already been said because everybody raised basically all of the points that I was going to raise. I want to echo what John just said about the student safety and, for example, the email that we got today, just with the follow through about the student coaches and all of that is excellent evidence um, to, to add to that um, and I think I'm, I'm hearing a moving recommendation towards um, a presentation around student data in April which I think would be great for so many reasons both as evidence for the goals and it's something that we've been talking about since your interviews <laughs> you know for however many years ago um, and I think to I think Lori's point um, a brief mention of that as we're presenting our budget at town meeting I think would also be really effective and, and in addition I think that would be an important thing to include um, in both the state of the town and the state of the schools presentations because I think that's something that we've had so much conversation about and is involving so much time and effort for you and the whole admin team yeah. I think that would be a great presentation so okay. um, so beyond those things I mean I in addition I really thought that the evidence around well let me take a step back. The way that you organize all of it is so makes it so easy. So I really appreciate. I think you know you've gotten it to a really great format. At least for me, it's yeah. so user friendly. Um, I like that it all ties back to the strategic plan. Um, it just it's very well organized. So it makes it easier and efficient for us to go through it, which I appreciate. And what I also want to say is I really appreciate the level of transparency that you're giving us into your day um, because you know we're in this awkward position really of evaluating you for a lot of things that we don't see you do and so um, so mm -hmm. I just I appreciate the transparency in there there's certainly a level of trust and risk that comes along with that and I want to acknowledge you for that and I think it's a great example that you're setting for the people that you're in turn evaluating mm -hmm. um, and I hope that they are I'm sure they're all home watching so they're hearing that but um, but yeah, I loved reading all, the, all of the comments, in particular the, the emails, and, and I appreciate you letting us see the feedback that you're getting from people that are working for you. That's really enlightening for us and just really strengthens what I think we already all think about you anyway. So, um, so yeah, I think they've already highlighted the areas that we'll be looking more for, you know, that'll, that are still in development for the end of the year. and. Um, you know, somewhere on the district website, you have to put a picture of you and Lords, though. Ah, oh, well, that, that was great. <laughs> that was a great picture. Uh, so, so that's all. I think I don't really have anything other 
than what everybody else has said um, to add, okay. but, but thank, thank you. you. Great. That's very helpful. So I don't have much to add at all. I um, did it more like Kelly, where I, like, I looked at goal one and I went through that key action items and I was like, I, I feel like I've seen all that. So when I went to the evidence, I didn't feel like there was anything I was looking for that wasn't there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and then just with respect to buildings and grounds, I think that's a huge um, additional responsibility on you and I, I applaud you for taking it on and I think it's actually a, a ton of work and just looking at the stuff that's been done. Um, I mean, I don't know what your plan is for future years, but I, I think if you think about that, the new school, and just all of the just sort of additional stuff that you have to do that, um, yes, it's, it's kind of in your goals, but it seems really sort of above and beyond what a regular superintendent goals might be in one given year. Um, I'm not saying that you should pair back, but maybe you should consider pairing back. Um, <laughs> I really... It might, um, it's kind of echoing what, what other folks have said about goal two, but <clears throat> I, I'm, not, I'm less concerned about presenting data. I have a real problem with this. How, what is it going to look like to show an adjustment to practice? Okay. And I, I looked at the stuff that was in there, and, and I understand that that's, that's not really it because it's ongoing. But I don't even know what my expectation should be of um, how you're going to sh show the adjustment to practice. And I think, I think it was like a technology presentation. Um, and in the presentation it was like, see, with all this technology, this is how you can help like differentiate and you can have like different levels of instruction in the same classroom. It would be nice to see evidence of, so now we have a lot more technology in our district, how, how that's helping, which sort of maybe combine some budget things that we're spending a lot of money on with how is this actually being used to adjust our practice based on our particular student needs. Mm -hmm. Because that's right the cell with the technology, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I can barely hear out of one ear, so I, I feel like I can't <laughs> tell if I'm talking really loud no, or no. I'm but making... Um, I would, can I just respond to that just yeah. ever so briefly? And all of these things are so helpful to me to help me understand how I need to do a better job of explaining it. So differentiation and adjustment to practice, two different things. Um, although we need to see both, I think what we need to stop saying is adjustment to practice, and what we need to start saying is how are you, how are you changing the instructional program? That's what we're talking about. So, and I'm going to use a technology example. <coughs> so if a student, for example, as part of their instructional program is supposed to participate in Lexia, a, com a computer-based program to improve phonics skills and phonemic awareness. We know from the reports that have been generated that if a student is using it with fidelity and if a student has been appropriately recommended for the program, we get tremendous results. But we also know from the reports that are generated that if student B is using it once a week, we can expect <laughs> no results. So the adjustment to practice or the change in, in instruction would be that I would see evidence that now this child is participating five times a week and we're going to see the related results. So that's a very specific example of how we can, based on data, make recommendations that are going to have a huge impact on student progress. And that's what I'll be collecting for you. Um, so, uh, so why I, I thought the two terms were, inter I don't know, intertwined, because I thought, so you get data yeah. and then you adjust your practice, which is going to lead to differentiating between your students because they came back with different data. Yeah, yeah. This is so, not correct. So, you know, they're just, they're terms <coughs> that are used so loosely in education mm -hmm. um, that what we typically mean when we talk about differentiating is within a regular classroom um, and we, we see it everywhere. You know, the best example <coughs> I can use is in, is in phys ed. So we have kids who are highly athletic, kids who, who are not as athletic in the same classroom and you see the phys ed teacher with, without even missing a beat have different expectations and a ton of things going on in the room at the same time. And for those of you who have coached, you know of what I speak, right? So you keep everybody engaged and active and being successful at a level that they can be successful at. That's what it looks like in a classroom when you're doing it for every lesson <laughs> that you do, like they do in phys ed, like they do in music class. So it's, it, what I'm looking for evidence of is at the individual level based on 
data showing a lack of progress and the other would be a different goal. Okay. But I understand I need, I need that evidence to clarify and I'm going to start to collect it because I, for pieces of this, I have evidence that I just, and I'll label them against the action. So as I enter new data, and thank you for the feedback. I know last year it, it was somewhat confusing and you asked me to, to organize it better. I will label the, um, under student learning particularly, goal two dot, dot one so that you'll know what key action it goes with. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You. Um, sorry, I'm looking to see what's next. Thank New you. business. Oh, good, oh, no. good. Thank right. you for your feedback. That um, was very are we still working on? No. We're done. Good. Yeah. You. We are um, at item C. Yep. Uh, for our consideration is the request and recommendation of the superintendent to improve the appointment of 2.4 FTE additional paraprofessionals as um, outlined in the agenda materials. Yep. Does anyone have any? Um, questions or comments with respect to the request and recommendation? Um, I did. Okay. So I understand Circuit Breaker being used for this year's budget because these were not uh, non budgeted positions. Um, <laughs> I think I'm more wondering is it were these added to the FY17 budget? No. So they were not. I guess my question is it seems like. These aren't students that are going to be graduating. So, so thank you for that question. And I also received that question from, from another school committee member um, through email. As you know, I'm working with Dr. Zaleski to look at reducing the need for the st on the student end on, on the level of paraprofessional support. So a student receiving a one-to-one -one assistant, if we're doing our job, should be graduating to a two-to-one two students to one paraprofessional, three students to one paraprofessional. Um, so she is doing that work and she's doing it <coughs> through the process of IEP reviews. She can't just change the IEP without the annual review and let's have a conversation now with the team as to how the student is doing. And we get reports all the time about how, you know, they really don't need a one-to-one. -one. They could be, and it's actually not great for the student because we want to encourage independence. So that's a long-winded way of saying to you that the, the plan is that these additional positions are only being funded until June. And we're anticipating that the work that she's doing across the district to look at the redistribution, what I don't want to be continually coming to you and recommending is that we just continually add on, add on, add on, and never go back to say, what, what can we be doing differently? So these students' needs will not disappear, but we'll be able to change um, other students who will need less support, and we can then reassign paraprofessionals. So I have limited knowledge on the IEP process, and you know I know there's a ton of laws around it. But I mean, what, what's our confidence that that change is going to absorb these needs? I guess. Because it, so if that didn't happen, you, you can't answer that question for me. But yeah. if it didn't happen, what's our backup circuit breaker again? I, I have every confidence it's going to happen. We've been having this conversation for two years now. It started um, last year. Uh, Karen Jewett started to have these conversations. Um, in the absence of calling individual meeting, and I'm getting anecdotal information from teachers that students are making these improvements. If they're not, then we're not doing our job for that individual student. And so the answer should not be to continually add on more. I, I have every confidence. Um, but in answer to your question, Lori, the, we would have to come back. It's not included. At, it, th these are funded until the end of June. We would have to come back and have this conversation again, and I would have to provide evidence to you as to why we haven't been able to reduce the needs for paraprofessionals as I've been as I've been expecting over the past the work of the past two years. So I hope we don't have to have that conversation, but if we do, um, I will be back here with Dr. Zaleski to um, talk about why it is that we're not. And my last question is: Are these are any of these new hires, or are these adding workload to existing? They're all new. They're all new hires. They're all new hires. Okay. 
that's all I have. Yeah, I mean, this this is not something that should we should be continuing to do. Um, to have to come to you and say, oh, somebody else moved in, and now we need more more staff. So uh, we're working to fix that. Um. So I might have missed it. Do we have a projected cost here? For the remainder of the year. And I assure you, I've been trying to look for the last five minutes, and I can't find it, even though I know it's in my email somewhere. What's our directionally? What was our target circuit breaker going into FY17? Budgeted at what percentage? Seventy. It, we're projecting that, that at the end of seventeen, which is probably an important number, one seventy-two. Assuming a seventy percent circuit right. breaker rate, which is low high compared it's, to last year, it's, it's like basically right what around it's been the number. Recently. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. like I know seventy-one, seventy-two, a couple yeah. years, but yeah. nothing. Okay. So this, so that one hundred and eight. Did you say one hundred eighteen? Uh, 172. Oh, one, 172. So this will eat into that. So we're more like 150 at that uh, point. And, and saying that we're going to charge a circuit breaker is only really if yeah. uh, we need to. Right. You know, um, there are a lot of moving parts right now in the special ed world, uh, and I'm working diligently to come up with a second quarter report that makes sense. Um, if you recall, the first quarter report said that we had uh, a buffer. Um, could easily absorb this, but there, there's been other things mm -hmm. happening there. Okay. So um, that's why we're saying we're asking now to use circuit breaker. We may change that uh, right. as the year goes on. And so the circuit breaker impact to this is probably less than, and I know we just had that conversation about how we don't think these are going to carry forward, but if they do, that puts a much bigger dent in circuit breaker going into FY17. Absolutely. For you, um, does anyone have comments or questions on the motion? I would seek a motion to approve the appointment of the additional 2.4 FTE paraprofessionals to be funded through Circuit Breaker for the remainder of the current academic year. So moved. Seconded. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Nickerson. All those in favor? Yes. 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 It's unanimous and so carried. And I would support not making you read out the motion. What? <laughs> I would support making My you not read out the hurt. motion because it sounds painful. Right and yeah, so right maybe right. the person <laughs> making the motion oh, from yeah. now on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel very loud. At least you can talk. The next um, up is the discussion. I thought you were going to say you'd be in favor of just moving this off the agenda so we can talk about it next time. Um, since it's not time sensitive. A warning of high school diplomas. <laughs> no one. <laughs> um, I don't think you get to do that. So, <laughs> for our consideration is uh, the procedure for the awarding of the high school diplomas. Um, I'm happy to start the discussion um, <laughs> currently, and I think, uh, well, actually, I don't know how far back. The school committee chair um, hands out the high school diplomas. Um, a request came in this year with respect to, from, for an individual student with respect to having the high school principal um, <coughs> give out the diplomas after conversations with Dr. McLeod and Mr. Bishop. Um, the consensus or the, the conclusion was it. D Many students um, have a special connection with Mr. Bishop, and it didn't feel appropriate or comfortable for him to just respond to this one student's request. Um, and so the preference would be either we should talk about either the school committee gives out the diplomas, Mr. Bishop gives out the diplomas, or you know Dr. McLeod gives out the diplomas. I mean, I think those are the three options that we have, unless someone wants to come up with another option. Um, so that's it. That's the reason why it's on here. Um, I don't know. Personally, 
for having given out the diplomas, I feel, and I'm sure it's because I'm removed from that age group with my children, um, I feel while it may be an honor for me, it's not necessarily about me as a school committee member, um, and it's more about the students, and I, I just don't feel like there's any connection um, to them, between them and a school committee chair. But I'm saying that as a parent of elementary students, and so I'm certain that you, it probably feels differently um, for people with older children or who've been in the school district longer, period. I think for me the point is more that the graduation is the culmination of the K-12 to experience. And so while certainly in high school they have a much stronger connection to the high school principal than to the superintendent to then to any school committee member, obviously. Um, you know, I, I guess it, it depends on, on which, what's the objective. If, if it's for the sort of the, the kids to, to pick, I'm sure they would all pick Mr. Bishop if it's to represent the sort of formality of the culmination of their entire public school experience then I think, you know, it's more appropriately handed out by the superintendent or, or the school committee. Um, so it's, to me, I think that's sort of more of the distinction rather than, yeah, I guess it's I, whose perspective you're picking, really. No, I, I, and I, I, I thought about that, and I, I think Dr. McLeod um, had, had brought that up in, in our one of our prior discussions. Um, and I don't know what percentage of students that actually are seniors at the high school have gone through, right, our entire district. It's probably pretty high. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, a, it is a high school diploma, so then I, I, I sort of, I, I feel like you could, it is, it's just a matter of perspective with respect yeah, to I that. Yeah, I mean, that wherever they started, they've completed our graduation requirements mm -hmm. by the time. I mean, you know, even the F1 students who have lived in uh, Europe or wherever for their entire life and only are here for one year. Still have to meet our graduation. <coughs> is there an eighth grade graduation? There is now. Okay, yeah. because yeah. I feel Colin like this is a yeah. high school graduation. I hear what you're saying from a culmination perspective, but I mean, there's like kindergarten graduations now and, you know, eighth grade graduation. I, I feel like this is the high school graduation. So. I feel like kids should only have one graduation. <laughs> if, we're, if we're really going to get down so, to yeah, it, so, <laughs> so this is—I mean, this is going to this is going to be a matter of, of, of opinions, yes. no matter how you, you get to it. But I, I think, to me, that I, I understand what you're saying about the culmination. I probably agree. I, I think I agree that it's more the culmination of the K to 12 experience than it is the, the high school graduation. But I think the more powerful point to me, and again, having done it. Um, was Ellen your point that it's it was an honor for me to hand out those diplomas and I have I'm a parent of elementary school children so I when the year I handed out the diplomas I knew four people to whom I handed a diploma but I, I so I thought about that as because I was we were preparing for this discussion and even if I knew more than that to me it's still more the experience of the student than it is anyone else and and so while I might know more if I had a, more students, if I had a, a student in high school, I don't think it makes it any more meaningful or more important that it be a school committee member. I don't know that I would feel differently, maybe slightly less awkward about my picture being on people's mantles I've never met before. But I, it, it's, it, I think it should be something that, that for the students, they have more of a connection. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm back and forth in my head between whether or not I feel more strongly that it should be the high school principal versus the superintendent. I'm trying to sort of separate myself from the individuals involved because we know that, that, that we hope it's really, it stays the same for a really long time, but we know that, that, that we might be making a decision here that could carry on longer than, than either the current superintendent or the high school principal are in their role. Um, and so I look at, I mean, Dr. McLeod has a tremendous presence in all the schools, so I think it would be meaningful to have you hand out the diplomas, but will the next, you know, would the future superintendent have the same? Mm. So I, I, I do think, however, that our connection to those students as school committee members, maybe as individuals it might be higher depending on, on where our kids are, but as school committee members is not, as significant and for the event, I don't think we should be the ones doing it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I, was, I, I mean, 
I also um, am wondering if it's a decision that's because of this fact, right, that actually at any given time it could be a new superintendent that year, right? Um, if it's something that the school committee should just start taking up in, you know, the second meeting in May and decide for that year. If people don't want to make the decision for this is how it's going to be. Yeah, but essentially, anyone I'm just could trying to take myself out of this vote. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. But anyway, <anyone> <laughs> I mean, you could May bring it up. It, whether or not you, you make it the decision today that you bring it up every year, someone could bring it up every year or something. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Preventing that's that. to legislate. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, I also, so we often look to what other districts do when we're looking at different things that, you know, we're trying to gauge. Um, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't queried other districts to know. I know what I did growing up and I, it was our principal and I agree with John that I feel like it's the, it should be the kids experience and, and granted having Evan as the current high school principal, it's easy to say that the kids would prefer Evan because <laughs> the number of kids that you watch hug Evan <laughs> as they cross the stage is amazing to watch. That may change based on different principals in the building. They might now all have the relationship, but they will all know who their principal is. So that's, that's where I feel about it. Now, whether or not it changes year to year, whether or not there are other special circumstances that come up, um, that, you know, that are taken up by the committee at that time, you know, I don't know. I guess I just, I, I, I wasn't going to say anything, but just listening to all of you struggling with this, <laughs> I'll just add a perspective um, that might be a little bit different, and that is that it's a ceremony based on tradition, long-standing tradition. Um, I think as you described it, and we see them going across, I was smiling to myself thinking, huh, I wonder if they can hug him quite so easily if he's also giving the diploma. But I think for them, they get their diploma and then they walk across the stage and there he is. So he's still receiving them. And I wonder if what we should be thinking about is, is ceremony and tradition um, versus who the person is. I don't, I don't think it matters to the kids as much as it matters to all of you. Who no, I'm sure of that. Them. I'm sure of that. <laughs> right, but well, I, but I will tell you. But I will tell you. Because one student asked, yeah. student asked that is true. and yeah. no one's ever yeah. asked the student body. I remember who gave so me mine, and it was the school committee chair. I mean, yeah. in my town. Yeah, but. I mean, and I think you know, the cast said it more eloquently than I did, but I just, and obviously, I'm not objective. I've already had two children graduate, and I have a senior this year, so I can't possibly separate my parent hat from any of this. But trying my best to do that. I think it's a formal situation. It's their graduation. We manage the budget. We set the um, graduation requirements. We approve the curriculum. You know, whether we see ourselves this way or not, on paper we're at the top of the food chain. And so I think a lot of people ascribe a level of ceremony and formality to having the school committee be the ones that bestow. Like when you're at your college graduation that they they bestow the, uh, what is that <coughs> standard phrase that they, but you know, all of the rights and um, whatever appertaining there too is the only part I remember. But at any rate, there's just a formality to it and I think that the school committee represents sort of the pinnacle of the entirety of the experience, the, you know, representation of the community because we're elected by the community to do this, not this particularly, but this job. And so <coughs> I, I think it's, a tremendous credit that this question was brought to us, um, a tremendous credit to our, our principal, but I love the way that our principal is already incorporated into the graduation ceremony, it, just exactly the way you described it, so I'm not going to even repeat that because I think you did it beautifully, but, and you know, and, and in addition we have the whole night before where um, the school committee is just a bystander and it's really more about the kids and <laughs> their own leadership in addition to the school building leadership. So, I mean, I, I really have always liked the way that our graduation ceremony feels very personal and tailored to each class. I like the way that we do it, and I don't have any interest in changing it. 
Having said that, I'm one out of five people, so the rest of you who don't agree with me, then there's nothing I can really do about it. But, but I think the formality and the ceremony sort of requires that it be the school committee. Anyone else have any other thoughts? <laughs> um, do, do we want to take a vote on this? Or do you guys want to wait till the end of May? <laughs> I, I, like it. I, mean, I mean, I guess, does anyone want to make a motion? That's how I should. I... <laughs> So this is the first time we're talking about it publicly. No one in the public knows that we are going to talk about this. So if we're going to vote on it, then I'd rather wait until the next meeting and see if we get any commentary on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. We could send out um, a list of the way we do with the minutes, Lori, letting people know that we're going to take this up. The policy? Sorry. What did I say? Minutes? Yeah. <laughs> Counting? No, I was yeah. saying it's late. Um, the way we do policy so that people know that we're going to take it up. Well, I'm not available at the next meeting, oh, so I prefer right. that we not vote on it then. Okay. Uh, I think yeah. the five of us should vote on it, and I'd like yeah. to hear what the community has to say before I cast my vote. So yeah. I have no objection to putting it on a future agenda, but I just appreciate being able to be here. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. May it is. <laughs> <laughs> Only if it's the first <laughs> meeting in May. Okay. Okay, second meeting in February, and I won't be here. So, oh. first meeting it's in like March. March. Nope, I won't be there either. <laughs> I was just sending you guys an email. I have two tra business travel trips that happen planned for both of those weeks. Okay. So you guys, it, you can choose to do without me. That's fine. I've already made my position known. No, um, I'm but okay. Because okay. I think we're not we're not time pressed. We're not time pressed. We're not. We're not time pressed. We could. I mean, no. we could literally. I mean, I'm not saying we should, but we could literally make this decision decision the day before graduation. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not. Print the programs. programs. So yeah, it, all right. Add, but I don't <laughs> think they do it in March. Hyperbole for effect, folks. Okay. <laughs> okay. Second, Second meeting, meeting of March, yeah. mm -hmm. and we will send out some kind of communication, what, to the high school parents or to everybody? I think everybody. Everybody. <laughs> communication that we're going to be taking it up at that meeting mm -hmm. for discussion and invite any, do you want me to go so far as to invite any input the way we do with any reason <coughs> sure. we would be we'd, there's no reason to send out the list of otherwise really right okay to the chair so if we're going to do a survey that I'm gonna need you, you to help me well, I'm because gonna, no, I'm, I'm gonna suggest I really not. think we're making no? so much we more like, out of yeah, this yeah. Okay. Yeah. We haven't thought of like option oh, number and then we'll be asked and we don't and we don't want a button vote we really only are interested in the feedback i, I think for people who are actually going to make an opinion known i mean i think it's a sort of thing where yeah we are yeah okay. So, the, okay so and there is a very strong possibility we will hear from no one correct <laughs> yeah I, I guess the only reason we would be delaying this or doing this is is if we were going to change the way it's done right now so that would be the purpose right right okay well, no, because we could hear back. No, we're, we're we thinking about it. We're not saying we're changing okay. it. We're no, no, considering it. It's the, yeah. it's the um, interest of the school committee yeah. to think about whether or not we want. Okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, this going to get ready to start thinking about yeah. Oh, so our meeting's actually the 24th because we're not I'll doing the first and third. In I'll ask you how to word it. <laughs> hmm. All right. Hmm. <clears throat> Sorry. I think that's the calendar meeting too. March the twenty fourth. We have to have it voted. Calendar then. meeting is the next meeting. Yeah. February fourth. Can you draft can you remote draft in? Calendar. That one I can make. It's the twenty fourth <coughs> of February and the. I can't. I'm sorry. But, but, it's but you'll give me your input. Out of town. Yep. Form. I'll send you all my questions before. Like <coughs> <coughs> okay. Superintendents, but this can be an easy one. <laughs> Budget recommendation. For our consideration is the request and recommendation following the individual budget reviews and public hearing of the superintendent FY17 budget. Well, I, we're not. Well, does, oh, does anyone have any 
What? Does anyone have any um, comments or questions on the request and recommendation? I just have one question. So I think the number is different than last time, and that is reflective of eliminating the K to six bus fees. Yes. And so is that the only change? Yes. Okay. That's the only change based on the feedback of, from our discussion, the takeaway and pre preliminary feedback. So the takeaway that we got in the absence of any other feedback that we've heard from the town, um, this was the recommendation for you to consider tonight. Okay. The only change that's happened to anything that you received up until and including the, um, the last presentation was to include in this recommendation the elimination of K-6 bus fees and no reduction of any other fees. Okay, so 7 to 12 bus fees, parking fees, athletic fees. Remain. All, okay, all the same, although we've lowered them m m all over time. multiple times, but not, not next year. And, and I guess my only other question is, and I assume the answer is no, because I think you would have led with this, but we've received no information from Nothing. the town hall about any updated Nothing. projections or new growth or chapter Silence. 70 or anything. So no. we're operating in a vacuum, essentially. We are. Um, I just, you know, I don't need to remind you that we made ourselves very available um, throughout the process and encouraged input um, and questions throughout, more so this year than any other time. Um, so no, we have not. Okay. Anything else? Mr. Manning, were you here because you had a question or comment on the request and recommendation of the superintendent? Okay. I think there's not going to be one. Okay, so I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll move to approve the FY17 budget recommendation of the superintendent in the amount of $40,902,901 <coughs> representing an increase of 4.495% oh, yeah. over the FY16 budget. Um, all those in favor? Yes. 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 Unanimous and so carries. Good work. Okay. School committee policy. Now, Sorry. this policy does not have letters. What right. Is it? Y yep. Can you, if you can hand that yep. out, please. <coughs> um, and it doesn't have letters because there also isn't a master policy. So is there a way to come up with, do you make up letters? That's a good question. I really don't know. I think we would have to probably use real letters. I mean. <laughs> what letters aren't going to be Yeah, we could ask. I'll get them. And I'll what they would recommend okay. as a letter. We'll assign it. If, if we do approve it today, we'll assign it letters based on whatever the MASC tells us. Okay. Right? I mean. I'm not, we won't get there tonight anyway, so. <coughs> what? We won't, uh, I don't think we'll get there tonight. Okay. So. So, for our consideration is um, the request and recommendation of the superintendent to review this newly developed school-owned vehicle policy. It has been adapted with reference to the town of Hopkinton's vehicle policy. It's been shared through the listserv. Um, we've talked about it, but this is our first reading. So, I'll remind the com committee that the way we did this last year is we had a subcommittee who did a preliminary look. This year, we're doing it live. So this is the first reading, um, and what I've handed out to you, um, Jean kindly um, offered to hi um, high line, red line, but they're really yeah. yellow. Track changes. Um, yeah. um, what, what Jean noted when she reviewed this was that there's not, there is inconsistency around reference to town um, I, I had asked Mr. Um, what's his name? Rogers to review this since he has the only vehicle that that we're referencing here. I mean, certainly we have other vehicles that stay on the property, but this is different. So he took a look at it and took some uh, preliminary. You know, these things re refer to him; these things do not. But there seem to be some inconsistencies. So I went through it <coughs> once I heard back from Gene, and you've been provided <coughs> with an updated copy and I thought we would do well um, to go through it tonight as a first reading and note and I can I can walk you through this um, because I've gone through it already so I think we can go through it pretty quickly if if that sounds okay to everybody okay so um, the reference to at the beginning the reference to the town I think is is appropriate
because they are town issued vehicles. Um, but when you look under general policy provisions, under number one, property or passengers related to school department visit, where it references town, that should say school department. So permissible use of town owned vehicles include transportation of property or of property or passengers related to replace town with school department. Does, does that make sense? Okay. And and then the last sentence I believe should be removed. It says during vacations or extended absence vehicles shall be parked at a designated town facility with the keys accessible at the department's office. I believe that sentence gets removed completely. Um, when we look further in the policy you will see that Al is included in emergency vehicles for the exact reason that he needs to be on call 24 hours a day. Um, last night's a good example. So it, it would never be the case that his, his vehicle would be parked, for example, at the superintendent's office and that he would drive his personal vehicle back and forth. He just leaves it in his driveway at home. But then what if the town, what if we needed it? Someone in the school department needed it. So we have other vehicles that okay. they use for the custodians use for various I mean, things. I feel like that would be the reason why it would, the keys would end up accessible yeah. to I someone mean, else. It, in his case, I guess, similar to mine, not that I have a town-owned vehicle, but in my absence, we have somebody that acts on my behalf, but we don't have, when Al's not here, we don't have a director of operations. We have somebody that steps in to manage emergencies. So if this policy only applies to Al, <coughs> Al, then we need to make that clear because we own a lot of, you know, there are a lot of other school-owned vehicles. Yep. So this really that was part of my confusion going through here. here because specifically because if you look under um, page two, all vehicles shall be registered to the town of Hopkinton. At the bottom, the following employees and officials may have town vehicles assigned to them for use in the conduct of their official business subject to availability of funding. And then they list emergency town vehicles. Mm -hmm. So the distinction that I'm making, and it may be completely wrong, is his is the only emergency town vehicle that I believe the school department has. I agree with that, but non-emergency town vehicles, we own many. Mm -hmm. And so, what you know, and they are driven. They are, you know, people need to use the keys when other people are on vacation. So, I don't know. I think. Well, right, and they could get a citation. A, a number right. of these phrases clauses make more sense in reference to those types of vehicles. Right, right. Well, I mean, because we're adapting the town policy that covers vehicles yeah. like that, but we're not including yeah. our vehicles like that in this. Right. So maybe what we do there on page three identify on the first page that this isn't in general school-owned vehicles. This is the Director of Operations vehicle policy. Take off the non-emergency town vehicles that are listed on page three because it doesn't pertain to those. Okay. We, we call out that this is the only, under the category of emergency town vehicles, it's the only vehicle that the school department owns or is responsible for. So this becomes an emergency school vehicle yes. policy? Okay. If, if that's what you want. I mean, I think well, we wanted I, some guidelines for him. I think, we, well, <laughs> yes, certainly, but I think we need to, I feel like there's someone, like maybe even Ray Neeris, that we actually need to ask this question of, like who should our, who's, which of our vehicles are covered under the town policy? So and I did find out that okay. the, the insurance for the, our vehicles is paid by the town. Well, that's, yes. Okay. I would think so. Okay. But no, I think that I think it, Jean, what you're trying to say is, what what policy these policies, non insurance policies, right. covers our other vehicles. So to me, I think you would go in the other direction, and you would make the policy apply to all the school owned vehicles and not just one. Okay. Because there, you may need to take those sections that are only appropriate for a vehicle that does go to and from the person's home and make that clear that it's only for that position. Mm -hmm. But there are other sections in here that would pertain to all of them. Like, right, like getting for instance, a ticket or having an accident. Or right, and how, you know, 
the citation and all that kind of stuff, being, you know, having to report if they got a ticket while driving it, because they, in order to go to different campuses, they have to be on town roads, so, so I feel like there are other parts of this that would be useful, but I guess that's where we would have to parse it out. You, you raised a question about finding out some information about other town vehicles. So it noted in here is that you mentioned all vehicles should be registered to the town of Hopkinton. So is Al's truck registered to the town of Hopkinton? I don't know. Where's so the, the question I have is, do we own it? Well, or does so the town own it? And, and the other vehicle, so I, what got me thinking about that is our our van, our van that we own, right. that we use for our life skills yeah. program. That has the Hopkinton Public Schools seal on it, I'm pretty sure, and Ralph would know that. Um, I don't remember if it also has the town seal, but yeah, I would assume that technically they're all covered under the town insurance and probably registered to the town. And so that's where it got into, like if you're, if you're in an accident, it, in here it says you have to report to the town manager. But then for a school vehicle, do you need to report to the town manager or the superintendent? Well, probably the superintendent. However, if it's under the insurance policy of the town, then you would probably have to also mm -hmm. report it to the town manager. Or So I, I just felt like... would make sure that Al is included on, under their policy? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering if that's the... If they I think if maybe they if, they amended, anyway. if they amended theirs to cover ours more specifically, that might be a more logical approach. Because, because they have all the insurance and they have the registrations. Can, but we can, I, su can I suggest, and, and I'll volunteer to be the one to do this, but maybe one of us and Dr. McLeod can take this back and kind of work through all the permutations of this in terms of the interaction with the town policy, etc. Well, we so almost, sub almost like old subcommittee style, but we could, unless you want to go in the other direction, which is to approach the town and have Al's vehicle included. But I don't know that we know that that's the right answer right now. That's the right. only mm -hmm. that's the that's the concern I have is is that that's that's the easy that's potentially the easier path to resolve it. I just don't know if it's mm -hmm. it, it might, it, I sense it's probably the right path, but I, I don't know. So my question, for, and I'm happy to do that, John, and thank you for volunteering. Are they school-owned vehicles? That's Are question any number of them? one, right? I think that's the fundamental question. Right. I mean, we just we changed. We use our budget to buy them, but if they end up being registered to the town, yeah, I think they'd fall under this policy. Well, yeah, right. and I think we, our budget is the town's money, so yeah. no. they right. probably are town vehicles. So, yeah. so right. we, I mean, these are town buildings managed by the school. Right, right. So, is that a relevant distinction? I mean, I think well, we that have three would be categories of vehicles. Clearly, other public schools have vehicles. Some have full bus fleets, right? right? And so for there not to be a policy in the MASC that covers it, yeah. <laughs> it Potentially seems an answer to, to your question, too. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Like should that should probably yeah. just tell the town yeah. to make their, po to ask, request that they change their policy to make sure that it covers. Well, so we have three categories that I can think of, right? So Al, our van, and our, all of our, like, maintenance. So I guess, yeah, that's the, really the question. Okay, John, that's, that's on your task list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? He, he volunteered. Right. I volunteered. You volunteered. At least okay. I could do since I suggested it. Our van and what was the third one? <coughs> um, Al's the truck and all the other maintenance vehicles and vehicles. golf carts and snow plows. Right. Are those all registered? But see, they're, I mean. The golf carts probably not. This, that's, this is all golf interesting. Cart. Right. Not unless it goes on the road. Do you want me to okay. start by asking? No, Norman, if this is a question we could ask of Ray? Well, I think the first, again, I think the first question is where are these vehicles registered? Or how are, how are they registered? Like, are well, they if the insurance is paid by the town, do we assume that they're registered <coughs> to the town or no? I assume nothing. What? I assume, assume nothing. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the town. Yeah, yeah, because that's how they send you your excise taxes. Oh, the excise tax people. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the treasurer. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, treasure. Can I borrow your okay. agenda first? I'll begin by asking where they're registered, and then I'll follow up, John, okay. with the time that no, we can get together. Dead. Yeah, that'd be good. Okay, right. so no action on item F. <laughs> um, item G, <laughs> for our consideration, is the request and recommendation of the superintendent for payment of invoices for capital projects 
as appropriated in Articles 24 and 26. Does anyone have any um, comments or questions with respect to the request and recommendation? No, there is a recommended motion before you. Would anyone else like to make it and say it? I'll move to approve the payment of warrant number 16-035 in the amount of $38,455.85 to the vendors as outlined in the warrant. Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. 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 It's unanimous and so carries. The tie sound travel quicker. Okay. And she's only Next got one good ear. The superintendent's Hi. contract for your consideration is the rec request and recommendation of the school committee chair to ratify the successor agreement to the superintendent's contract. Um, this was voted on in executive session, so we're just ratifying that vote here in open session. So moved. <laughs> Motion by Ms. Birchman, second, second. by Mr. Graziano. <laughs> um, we'll do a roll call. Ms. Birchman? Yes. Mr. Graziano? Yes. Ms. Knight? Yes. Okay, but if I wasn't at executive session, do I not vote? You, you can, can vote because you're vote. here. Oh. <clears throat> Ms. Um, Nickerson? <laughs> yes. And I'm a yes. It's unanimous. So theories. We have no old business. We have an opportunity for public comment. No. Okay. Um, items by consensus. We're going to remove item E. Dr. McLeod. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve the operating budget and other funds warrant number 16-033 in the amount of $373,762.31. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve the high school student activities warrant number 16-034 in the amount of $14,682.13. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve the minutes of the special school committee meeting of April 29, 2015 as indicated in the agenda materials. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve the minutes of the regular school committee meeting of May 14, 2015 as indicated in the agenda materials. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve the <laughs> minutes of the regular school committee meeting of September 10th, 2015 as indicated in the agenda materials. So moved. Recommend. Nickerson, all those in favor? Yes. 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 And so carried. Um, our next meeting is Thursday, February 4th here in the middle school library and then the February 25th after the vacation here in the middle school library. I would seek a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Uh, motion by Ms. Nickerson, second by Mr. Gra seconded by Mr. Graziano. All those in favor? Yes. yes. Unanimous and we're adjourned at... We just adjourned. We, I'm sorry, we just adjourned. Did you not, did you not hear me make a call for public comment? Yeah. We'd have to. I mean, this is certainly listen to. I don't know if it's a part of the yeah. minutes. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, I don't mean yeah. to say you shouldn't. Talk okay, so it, it's we're, we're sort of we're, we're procedurally locked up. They're trying to figure out like if we can. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to come up and introduce yourself? Are we still broadcasting? Good. Okay. Just checking. <laughs> <coughs> I was really happy to see the new trash barrels in the front of the school, but um, the peripheral lots still don't have any, and consequently they're kind of riddled with trash and also the surrounding fields. Um, and it just, the sad thing about the litter is it just doesn't blow into the next lot. It blows into the surrounding woodlands and wetlands, and then it just is, you know, permanently polluted. And in fact, in, um, in field 13 is a typical example of a, t a tipped over trash barrel that's never been emptied, and it just is like permanently tipped on its side. And so, in other words, <laughs> we need trash barrels, but we also need to have them be emptied. And um, I know that the, the, the wonderful thing would be to cut it off at the source and to not have litter in the first place, but it's going to happen. And it just seems it has to be somebody that's going to pick up the slack because 
the, what in fact what suffers is the environment. Who's ever at fault, it's the environment that suffers. So it just would be nice to have some kind of thing in place where even though we got to educate and promulgate and maybe start finding, I don't know what to do, but pick up the slack at the end at the end of the line. And um, apart from the little litter, there's the big litter, like the, um, the from the athletic department, whatever there. It's not just bleachers. It's miles of piping. It's netting. It's um, unidentified objects. You can't even tell what they are. But they're just, instead of bringing them to the dump, they're making the grounds into a dump. It's like a whole strip. It's like a strip dump. And then each field has its own little dumping area. So that's like a major cleanup. It's going to take a lot of a bit of a budget. And, um, and then there are other, I just from walking around, because I live right next door, I notice all these things. There are other maintenance problems. There's um, blocked storm drains, which can lead to a lot of safety issues. The water not draining, it freezes, causes ice. And um, there's broken guardrails with spikes sticking out. There's missing signs, it's signs just lying on the ground beside it. So there just doesn't seem to be enough monitoring or you know, caretaking of the grounds itself. So I would just like to see enough in the budget to be a little more adamant okay. about that. Do you want me to <laughs> but so I just want to acknowledge, I want to just acknowledge Peggy's passion and the time. I mean, clearly it's frustrating to you. You've come to us numerous times. You continue to say the same things. Um, and I want just to um, reiterate that I want, uh, no, no, I'm not going to say I'm doing all I can. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say, please continue to bring these things to my attention. Okay because it, this is not okay, it's not acceptable, but the school committee has um, made a commitment to the improvement of the grounds by, by um, recommending an additional grounds person to our budget for next year. Um, and I'm not saying that that's as an excuse to you if I'm hearing that there's no peripheral barrels when this is something that I have ordered to have happen, then that's not okay. So you don't and mind if I touch base with you? I do not mind. I, yeah, this is such a high caliber school. You yep. think the grounds no, would be like a showcase? It should be, and, and that's, that's why we. That's why the you know the recommendation and the approval of an additional person has been put in place. But in the meantime, these have been direct re requests from me, and if they're not happening, then um, I need to. Well, here's my inevitable recent okay. picture. Okay. People that haven't seen them. Thank you. Yet. Thank those you. Those are all recent. Okay, I'll pass Thank them. You. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for Thank sitting you. through Thank the meeting. Okay. Yeah.